Testing one, two, three. Yeah. I only left two two bodies in the road. You didn't hear that. You did not hear that. Oh. Okay. Well, good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. It's the witching hour here. And uh, but before I call the meeting to order, I do want to announce some committee members, staff, and the public are attending remotely via Zoom as well as on site. All participants joining by phone should mute their phones when not speaking to avoid background noise. When speaking, please speak directly into a microphone to ensure everyone listening is able to hear your comments and to assure a clear record is made. During the meeting, please make sure that you announce yourself by name and title every time you speak so the public that is observing knows who is speaking. This is critical given the number of remote participants and is current guidance from the Kansas Attorney General. The public is allowed to participate by Zoom or submit comments by email prior to the meeting, and those comments will be included in the record of this meeting. The public may also indicate their intent to provide remote public comment by contacting the clerk's office by 5 p.m. the Thursday before the meeting. The public also will have an opportunity to provide brief comments either by telephone or via Zoom from the fifth floor conference room of the municipal office building. With that, I will now call the meeting of the Economic Development Finance Standing Committee to order. I would ask the clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Present. Davis? Present. Townsend? Here. Bites? Here. McKiernan? Here. Burroughs? Here. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk, is there any uh, revisions to tonight's agenda? There are no revisions. Thank you. I do want to recognize uh, our BPU board member, uh, David Haley, is joining us this evening in person. Welcome back, David. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's good to be back. Glad session is okay. finished up into the committee. We have uh, six items this evening. Five of them will require action, and one of them is for information only. So with that, item number one, the first amendment to a assignment is assumption and amended and restate agreement to the home field CID. And I believe that we will recognize Patrick Waters, acting chief counsel for remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I believe that the developer and their counsel has a presentation that they'd like to start off with. So I will turn it over to them. And, and, and gentlemen, for those watching, would you please introduce yourselves so that they know who is speaking? Uh, my name is Richard Knapper, uh, 1671 Kansas City Road, Olathe, Kansas, representing Homefield, uh, the master plan developer and the developer named under the development agreement. Uh, first off, uh, thank you all very much for your time tonight. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be in front of you and update you with where this project is and then also walk through what we're requesting this evening to see this project through to its fruition. It is further interesting to me that when you look back 
and this is a little ironic we're here this evening or in the month of May of 2023. It's 10 years ago this month that I started working on this master plan. Um, initially for the prior financial partner for the land that surrounded the former water park and today for the current owner home field uh, that is developing what, what was the water park and the rest of the remaining land. You know, since 2013, we've seen the development out there of hundreds of millions of dollars in development activity. Ford, Nissan, Chrysler, and Jeep all were out of state companies coming into the state of Kansas into Wyandotte County from Texas, as well as Louisiana, employing great numbers of people, paying large property tax and creating a lot of jobs. Uh, further Enterprise Rent-A-Car is on site, Phillips 66, Go Big Car Wash, Freddy's, Frontier Justice, Menards, Camping World, which is the largest RV dealer in the country, a large public, tr publicly traded company. We have the National Training Center for U.S. Soccer. We have a Fairfield Inn and Suites, the world headquarters of Dairy Farmers of America, the largest private employer in the Kansas City metropolitan area. We have a $50 million plus Class A market rate apartment complex finishing development by Millhouse out of Indianapolis. We have two medical office buildings. Currently under construction, we have the home field indoor multi-use sports arena that will be unlike anything else in metropolitan Kansas City. We have the home field outdoor baseball complex, 800% synthetic turf, baseball fields lighted. We have a Margaritaville resort hotel with large outdoor amenities of home field outdoor. As you'll see here in a moment in the rest of the slideshow, we have other users uh, coming Atlas 9, which is very similar to a Meow Wolf concept, if you've seen that across the country. We have Big Shots Golf, which is the largest competitor to Top Golf. I remember 10 years ago, I had people all throughout this community asking me, when can we get a Big Shots Golf, I mean, a Top Golf? We have Big Shots. Big Shots is owned by Club Corps, largest owner of golf courses in the country, to my knowledge, that owns the National Golf Club, as well as Nicholas Golf Club here in town. We have a deal uh, pending with Live Nation, the largest concert promoter in the country. Uh, we have a concept going with Success Pickleball, Hilton Garden Inn, Supercar Guys, another medical office building, um, and an indoor karting concept that is one of the largest entertainment attraction uh, uses in the country. So there's been a lot of progress in the past 10 years. That was in the past 10 years. In the past two years, um, progress is the, as in part of this I touched on earlier, but to elaborate a little bit further, construction has commenced on the 150,000 square foot home field building. I will have an image of it here shortly. Construction has also commenced on the baseball facility. Final development plan was approved for the Margaritaville Resort and mass grading is underway. We have uh, applied for footings and foundations permits. We are anxiously awaiting that permit and we will start footings and foundations. Uh, Camping World, as I said, the largest RV dealer in the country is open for business. Fairfield Inn and Suites set to open in August. And as noticed before, Millhouse, the apartment developer is, is I understand uh, taking reservations and residents are moving into that complex. I go back to 2013 as I opened up my comments. I'm sure a lot of you remember this. That was what it looked like in 2013. Since then, all the named people, uh, all the named users that have occurred are under construction, open for business or under contract and letter of intent. I did not want to bore everyone here with about 35 images, so I kept it brief, but I thought this one from 2013, looking easterly, was, was very interesting. The National Training Center, a premier athletic facility, the world headquarters of Dairy Farmers America, mass grading for home field outdoor and the Margaritaville Resort. Uh, a, a footnote, Margaritaville, and home field outdoor as currently referenced in our development agreement, which is but a year old, was called out collectively as about $100 million on the budget in the development agreement. Today, that number is $150 million. That is a sizable increase. We've not changed the scope dramatically, but I think we've all witnessed inflation 
labor shortages and just how expensive everything is. Uh, and we remain fully committed to this, to this build. We have not decreased the scope or decreased what we're doing. It's $150 million. You can see towards the back of this image, this is the baseball facility. It is hard to tell from this vantage point, but that's the, that is the four easterly most baseball diamonds, fine graded, and there's actually the light poles up as well. The westerly diamonds are being cut in as well. Another image of Homefield Outdoor in Margaritaville with the Mill House apartment complex in the background. The steel structure is nearly topped out on the home field 150,000 square foot multi-use indoor sports facility that will bring people in from all across the Midwest. Another image of it looking west that shows the Millhouse apartments and the rest of the development. <clears throat> Images of the Margarita River Resort, which I just referenced that that along with the home field outdoor amenity components right now is price tagged at $150 million. That is the Land Shark Signature Restaurant on the left, the hotel tower in back of it, and the outdoor pool amenities cozy up next to it. The indoor pool, so that we can activate this resort year round. Uh, there is a ninja course that drops down from the ceiling. There is a rock climbing wall that when the kids fall off the rock climbing wall, which is not but 10, 12 feet tall, but they will fall into the pool. Um, you know, I know my son would have loved that when he was a little bit younger. Uh, we've, I've hit on baseball a couple times. Uh, part of what is in the development agreement amendment uh, is in our current development agreement. There was a user that was our uh, more or less our, our, our operator within uh, the development agreement for the baseball facility. Um, unfortunately, that user uh, at the past 11th hour became in default of their lease agreement with us. Uh, not only were they trying to uh, reduce the usage fees or rent fees to use the fields 65%. Uh, they were also not meeting other financial obligations under the lease. Um, we went to find, you know, Perfect Game was one of the premier operators. There are other premier operators in the country, and our mission was to find another premier operator. And as it turns out, when you look at our development agreement, as it was written a year ago, everyone wanted to make sure that what we were building, the facility we were building, was class A and met certain standards. And the standard called out in our development agreement was you must be like Lake Point in Atlanta. And that is one of the mothership youth baseball facilities in the country. Um, Lake Point was previously managed by Perfect Game. They were removed and a company called PBR Tournaments was put in place. And they are managing and operating the baseball facility referenced in our development agreement that we must be like. PBR Tournaments is our operator in the, for the baseball fields. We have found an equal or better operator than we ever had before. Briefly touch on the new tax, the new tax generators and attractions that I hit on earlier. <clears throat> uh, Hilton Garden Inn, uh, Supercar Guys, which is owned by the largest automotive dealership group in the, in the uh, state of Kansas, Success Pickleball, Big Shots Golf, Atlas 9 and Live Nation. Those collectively add about $200 million of additional development costs. Honestly, when this is published from that time to today, the 190 is probably up to 210. A brief image of Supercar Guys, Hilton Garden Inn, 6S Bar and Grill. This is the pickleball concept. Then we come to Big Shots. This, I think, is one of the most exciting concepts we've had at this project in the 10 years I've been involved. These are uh, images of uh, current big shots. They have slightly refined their prototype. Uh, we are one of three big shots moving forward in the United States for 2023 into 2024. An uh, adult type outdoor putt putt golf. Uh, of course, kids can play as well, but th there is no clown's mouth. Uh, other outdoor games as well. Food and beverage. All these dots are where Big Shots and Club Four have touches of golf and entertainment related complexes throughout the country. More imagery of Big Shots. Then we come to Atlas Nine. If any of you have been to Meow Wolf, as I referenced before, you would know that this, this is a concept similar to Meow Wolf. Um, if you've not been to Meow Wolf, I would ask you to Google that when the meeting is over. 
and this would be a better, more attractive version to that. It's an, it, it is an immersive, interactive museum. The three Meow Wolf across this country bring in visitors from all across the country, um, large employment, large revenue, and um, again, a tourist attraction. Live Nation, largest uh, concert promoter in the country. We are trying to finalize the deal with them for a uh, 55,000 square foot indoor multi-use arena. Uh, they would anchor it for about 110 nights with music. The rest of the events would be activated with uh, sports and sports related. When you look at the indoor sports that we have uh, within the home field organization, and to have the championship volleyball or basketball game in a facility like this would be awfully exciting for the players as well as the parents. Other sports, uh, esports, um, cornhole, we, we've had them active in our other facilities. Uh, again, activating this with other indoor sports, on uh, dance, cheer, and the like uh, for this facility as well. An image of an, a current uh, model that Live Nation is looking at. And this is the updated master plan, uh, color coded for what is existing under development and what is slated for development in the near term. Major components, of Kurt, I'm gonna let you take it from here. And thank you. Mr. Chairman, Kurt Peterson here with Pulsinelli on behalf of the developer. With Richard's remarks as the backdrop, talking about the overall project, I want to remind us and kind of draw our attention to why we're specifically here tonight, which is a pending proposed amendment to the existing development agreement for the overall home field project. This is the first of two steps tonight in going to full commission of making that 200, let's call it $200 million of additional investment happen. It's two steps. Tonight's the first going to full commission. Later this summer, is the other. And the reason we have to wait on that is because it involves star bonds. And as you all know, everybody knows um, sitting in this room that that also involves the state and just takes a little longer to get that piece going. So tonight is step one of two steps for this additional couple hundred million dollars of investment. So tonight, the DA amendment is this critical first step that has the following components. And I know the UG's attorney, Todd LaSalle is here and we'll go into more detail, but I wanna touch on it for the kind of a culminating, culminating point. The first is that it officially recognizes three of these pieces, these new projects that make up the several hundred million dollar additional investment. That is Big Shots, Atlas Nine, and the arena, what Richard referred to as Live Nation. Second, it recognizes PBR as the new baseball operator, again, as Richard touched on. Third, it establishes an adjusted home field baseball predictable tax amount. Already as part of that, getting that deal financed and moving forward, there was a predictable tax amount that was set and approved by the, by the full commission. But now, because instead of having 10 field, 10 fields, the, the fields are all east of 90th Street altogether. It was that two clovers you started to make out, the two sets of four in that photograph Richard put on the screen. There used to be the concept of two additional fields making 10 on the west side of 90th, but both the former baseball operator and now the current one, PBR Tournaments, said there really isn't. That is not creative to the business model. It doesn't really make sense, especially cost benefit. So now it's eight fields altogether on the east side. And because of that, the predictable tax amount is adjusted by 20% to reflect going from 10 to 8. The next is the establishment for the first time of a Margaret Readville Resort and Home Field Outdoor predictable pilot amount. We worked with UG staff on trying to figure this amount out. Getting this right is critical because there's really nothing like Margaritaville Resort and the amenities it will have anywhere in the state. And so predictability is key. As you can imagine, when you put together the capital stack, the equity and the debt for something like this, everybody wants to know what the taxes are gonna be, not just for a year, but for the foreseeable future as it stabilizes. It's really, really hard to finance a $150 million hotel with this sort of amenity package. And this is a key aspect to make sure we get this fixed predictable taxes in place. And then the last piece, kind of summarizing again, what's before you tonight as part of this amendment is the CID bond financing. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see a map. And the map, you'll see the colors there. The red indicates 
what will be within the proposed Community Improvement District, CID. The blue is just that you always, when in Kansas, we always connect our pieces of the district, and that's all public right away. Very common approach to piecing together a CID district. But the red is what you'll want to focus on. There are six projects within the proposed CID, within that red area. So if you start on the right of the screen, east of 90th there, you'll start with home field baseball. If you move to the west, you're down on State Avenue now, you'll have the home field training facility. And then lastly, if you move to the last red area farthest to the west, the former water park area, you'll have in the northern part, Margaritaville Hotel and Home Field Outdoor, all the associated amenities. You'll have the Live Nation Arena just to the east of that, still within that big red area farthest west. You'll have big shots as you move south from there. And then if you go down on State Avenue, that southwest corner, the southwest red piece you see there, that is where you'll find the Atlas Nine uh, Museum. So why a community improvement district and community improvement district bonds? Well, first, we have to understand that there's two financial components to it that affect those red areas. One, there would be, as proposed, a 2% additional sales tax on any sales that happen within those red areas. That is cash registers for the six projects I just mentioned. The second piece is a CID special assessment. And the special assessment would apply to three of those pieces. Specifically, there would be one, a $2 ticket fee on anyone entering the Atlas Nine Museum. Second, there'd be a $2 ticket fee on anyone going to an event at the arena. And lastly, there'd be a $30 resort fee for use of all the amenities at the Margaritaville and Homefield Outdoor Resort. And that makes up together the special assessment component of the Community Improvement District. Now those revenues, the sales tax and the special assessments would all be bundled and underwritten and would be part of a, as proposed, as requested, a CID bond issuance to third party bond purchasers. The bond proceeds, once the bonds are purchased, the proceeds of the bonds would be used to help finance the attractions that Richard went through in some detail uh, on the screen in front of you within the CID. And while all of that is important to the overall project, all of these is absolutely the most important one from a temporal perspective is the piece that would go to help finance this $150 million resort hotel and amenities. The construction loan for that project, that is the resort, requires that all of the financing be in place to have any of the financing, which is totally typical, right, for those of you that are involved in financing pieces. The lender wants to see you have it all there, and part of that is the CID bonds. So the UG has engaged, uh, subject to all this moving forward, has engaged Stiefel, a common underwriter for UG projects, to look into this underwrite everything. And with this body's recommendation, hopefully, and then the full commission later in the month approval, we would move forward to uh, getting these CID bonds issued later in the summer and getting the financing in place and the hotel resort and the rest of the projects moving forward. So chairman, one last piece uh, be before we're just available uh, for your questions and inquiries is this, we couldn't help ourselves as we were kind of collecting our thoughts and putting this all together. How do we be succinct, but a lot. I mean, this is this is six months of solid work by the team trying to more than that, putting everything together. How do we do it quickly that gets you all the substance you need for you to make a good judgment uh, about where you, whether you want to see all this move forward? And one question <laughs> jumped out. We said, "There's a lot of money. There's also a lot, there's a ton of private money being proposed to be spent. There's a ton of amenities for Wyandotte County, but there's also a lot of a lot of uh, what we call public financing, right? And so the question on the table that we wanted to ask and answer briefly is. Is this what's before you tonight? Is this good for the taxpayers and citizens of Wyandotte County? It's a lot of money. So I'm going to attempt briefly to answer that, maybe to cause you to have some questions we can dialogue about later. One, and you can guess what we think the answer is that we wouldn't have spent this much, much, much time on this, but one is property taxes, real property taxes. I've had the privilege of working in this county on this project, even in the previous iteration, right, that, that laid the kind of the foundation for what we're doing today. And there's especially a few commissioners in this room that have pounded the table again and again and said, I'm supportive of all this. This is great for the county, but I want to see property tax generation go to the taxing jurisdictions, including the, the city and county, the, the UG. So I will tell you this in brief, a little bit of a sketch. The property tax generated by the overall project is mind-blowing. 
it's a ton of tax, but I don't even need to go there. I just want to focus on what Richard has said before you tonight. And in fact, I'm going to do a sub part of it. He laid out six, if you saw on that slide, there were six new projects that would cost somewhere in the range of, you know, another $200 million. Because the arena and Atlas 9, the museum, just to be totally honest, no one has a clue yet about what the tax would be. We'll be working with staff. That's part two this summer we said we'll come back with. We'll talk to you about that later. Let's just focus on the last, the, the other four pieces. The other four pieces, estimates that we can go into great detail and work through with you, but estimate generates another one and a half million dollars in real property tax. That's not counting the other two components. That's not counting all the components Richard went through. That's not counting the components that are still to come with everything this, you know, positive feedback loop creates. Huge, massive property taxes involved just with what's before you tonight for the unified government, the school district, and the other tax jurisdictions. Two. This level of investment and in construction creates an immense number of construction jobs, but then also ongoing operational jobs forever in this county, in this location. Huge benefit. Next, the amount of visitation, and I already used this phrase, but it's one of my favorites for projects like this, positive feedback loop. When we put into the biggest, the state's biggest tourist destination, right, that's already here, it's already operating that way. And we drop another a total of, you know, almost a billion, like 800 million, another 200 million a night and bring the amount of tourists that these amenities will bring. It has an amazing feedback loop on bringing more development and, you know, more residential and more commercial and, and everything. So the, the positive feedback loop is incredible with this level of investment. Next is just to re briefly reflect on the history. And I know you all appreciate the history here. We had a water park that obviously had tragedy and we had a major problem for a prime area of Western Wyandotte County. That whole section was tainted, right? It was. What goes there? What, what builds around that? What do you do with that? And the current developer, which Richard and I represent and work for, has frankly solved that problem with your partnership. And not only have they solved that, but also you'll remember the 2015 B star bonds had some, we call it credit enhancement, credit enhancement by the UG. The UG stands behind it with their pen. By the way, not what's proposed for this summer with CID bonds, totally special obligation bonds, different topic, right? But, but this developer found a way to take care of that. And the UG no longer has their signature, if you know what I mean, credit enhancement on the 2015 B bonds. Also big shots that you saw there, that has an immense amount of sales, just from all their track record, all of that sales, will go to the 2015A, the existing star bonds, and feed those. It's a, it's, a, it's a great thing. Lastly, just making a remark again, why is this good for the taxpayers? How amazing to live in the county where you also get to use these amenities, right? When your family and friends come into town or just on the weekend. This is incredible that this is, this is an amenity for the residents of Wyandotte County. So finishing with what was the question, what was the answer? Do we believe? respectfully, that what is proposed tonight, that there's another $200 million of capital investment in Wyandotte County in this overall project, is it good for the taxpayers? We think respectfully, Chairman, it, it's, it's amazing for the taxpayers and we're proud to be presenting it to you. So with that, we'd be ready after either now or after Ms. Mr. LaSalle speaks to address any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Mr. LaSalle? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Committee, Todd LaSala from the Stinson Firm, uh, representing the UG on this, uh, as, as I have for a long time. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on the development agreement, the First Amendment to our development agreement and what it does. It, it essentially accomplishes four things. I don't want to show you what those are. Okay. These are the four primary changes we're looking at tonight in the development agreement. And the uh, the gentlemen from home field have really alluded to what those four things are. I'm going to try and crystallize these and do this very quickly. One, we're going to change what our development agreement currently says about how we do community improvement districts here from a preference towards pay-as-you-go CID to a bonded CID issued by the Unified government. Two, the developer will commit 
to those new project, many of those new project components that they were talking about, we'll get a contractual commitment along with a commencement date and a completion date for those components. And I'll, I'll go into detail about what that looks like. Third, there are changes to home field baseball that, uh, that the guys talked about, including the change of the operator and the reduction of the fields from 10 to eight. We'll touch that too. And fourth and finally, some changes to the industrial revenue bond or IRB bond, part of our financing project. And I'll give you some detail about that as well. Okay, first, change to CID bonds versus pay as you go. Well, what, what does our development agreement currently say, the one we executed last summer? It really talks about the availability of using Community Improvement District CID in this project, uh, one or more CIDs, but really expresses a preference for pay as you go CID versus bonding them as an issue. Um, the one exception to that was the developer even then was telegraphing, hey, for the Margaritaville Hotel, I think we're going to need to bond. And it says that the UG reserves the right to have the commissioners make a decision about bonding the Margaritaville component as and when that more information becomes available. That's what it says today. Um, so what, what's changing? The developer is, is requesting a number of changes to the CID structure. Number one, all of this they'd like to bond as opposed to pay as you go. Um, and the UG would be the issuer, we go out publicly, we sell, we'd sell these bonds publicly. Is there some risk related to that as the issuer? Sure. Now, as the guy said, we're not, we're not gonna back these bonds. The sole pledge will be the revenues generated from the CID. But to be fair, when bonds don't perform, you're still the issuer. You get those calls. And there are rating agencies that are taking a more jaundiced view, even of special obligation bonds. And so it's just a risk we need to be cognizant of that didn't exist in last year's development agreement. It is going to be more prevalent now. Secondly, it's not just the Margaritaville Hotel anymore that we would bond. It's these other components as well. Home field baseball, home field outdoor, um, Atlas 9, the arena, all of those would be covered by the CID bonds we'd issued, not just the hotel. So it's, it's broader in scope. Another way that it's different and broader is that we're not talking about just CID sales tax and the 2%. We're also talking about these concepts that Kurt alluded to, a resort fee, uh, a ticket fee. Those are unique to some of the components that are now coming. And there's a revenue opportunity there that really wasn't contemplated before, but is part of this deal now, particularly for Atlas Nine, the Arena, and the Margaritaville Hotel. So the difference in those things, based on what the original development agreement contemplated versus now when you get into a bonded environment, it's the difference between about $25 million worth of net bond proceeds versus $60 million. So it's a much bigger number. Um, the developer team will tell you, this is a much bigger project and a much bigger capital investment. That's why. But I want to be clear about how this is different than what was on the table last year at this time. Secondly, the new project components. The guys did a great job of articulating what those things are. Um, these are things that were not contemplated in your original development agreement. It's all new. They're going to contractually commit to all of these things. And it's very, very positive for us. Big Shots Golf is a $20 million project with 60 bays. Um, the sports live music arena, the Live Nation component is a $53 million project, uh, 55,000 square foot arena, and they would contractually commit to deliver that. And Atlas Nine, the guys talked about, very unique art museum, immersive. Uh, I did go visit one of these Meow Wolf because I was interested in it. I went to one in Denver. It is, there's really nothing like it. It is a very unique component. Um, and that's about a $26 million ad. So just within the CID, uh, there's $99 million worth of new project components that were not committed to be delivered to us before. So all of this is new. The guys showed you before where those things are. I won't dwell on this, but this is what the CID district would look like. This is the budget. This is attached to the First Amendment to the Development Agreement. 
And it really shows you the various components that are within the boundaries of the community improvement district. That first column shows you the total cost of those projects as contemplated. And the second column shows you where the $60 million in net bond proceeds would go. Uh, and when you do the ratio and you look at those numbers, when you talk about CID alone, it's about 20% when you compare the total cost of those projects versus the CID that's contributed. Now, there are footnotes here that, that make clear for some of these components, there are also star bonds in the equation. Uh, when you talk about home field, uh, indoor and home field outdoor, those there are star bonds contributing. So when you add those to the mix, the public private ratio here, the the um, public component is north of 40%. So it's a it's a different it's a different number. Um, but to be fair, that's what we're talking about. One other thing that I should point out, the arena component and Live Nations, the developer is talking to Live Nations and has is down the road a ways with them in their contract negotiations. Our amendment would allow them to pull out Live Nations if they don't get all the way to the finish line or get far enough it, as we proceed toward bonding. They have the ability to pull back on that and pull Live Nations out of the equation to do it in the future in another different CID, and it would come off of the table. Now, there's some mechanics and some gymnastics to how we would do that, but I want to be clear that even though these other things are really pretty hard and fast contractual components, Live Nations, they have the ability in their discretion to pull that off the table and not do that as a part of this CID. Uh, changes to baseball. The guys did a good job of articulating this. They talked about the change from perfect game to PBR. The development agreement amendment would now take care of that and fix that. It also reduced reduces the baseball field commitment from eight fields to 10 field, or I'm sorry, 10 fields to eight fields. And then I also want to talk for a moment about hotel rooms. Um, the baseball component of this project, a major part of it has always been that it would attract lots of families to our community to play here and be here for a weekend. There's a bunch of good things that happen when that occurs, including hotel room nights in your community. And our development agreement even from last summer has a prioritization and a booking system that we're asking the baseball operator to use with these families and prioritize first, you know, um, hotel rooms that are within our district, then second hotel rooms that are within the county, and then third hotel rooms that are within the state. That's the prioritization of booking hotel rooms for baseball. There's a caveat to this because PBR currently has a facility in Parkville, and there was TIF involved in that over on the Missouri side. And accordingly, PBR already has a contractual commitment to promote the Creekside Hotel there in Parkville. It's a 92-room hotel, and so it has to be an exception to our agreement with them about the way that they promote hotel rooms. Now, they'll tell you that's not a very big hotel. They contemplate PBR having um, very large tournaments that will use both facilities, and they, they believe it will be net positive to the UG. But I want to be very clear that when we get into this amendment, they are carving out in our prioritization this one hotel in Parkville because they have to contraction. Uh, I, this map they showed you before, the only reason I'm putting it there is I want to show you on the far right in that purple area, that's where the eight fields remain. That's the same place they were located uh, last summer when we did this. The, the two fields that are removed are in that other purple box, uh, just on the other side of 98th along State Avenue. That's where the other two fields that were, were previously located, those are the ones that are going away. All right, I'll conclude by talking about industrial revenue bonds. Uh, the IRB financing, the guys have done a good job of talking about this. They're really certainty industrial revenue bonds. We're really not trying to use the vehicle, in this case, for tax abatement, but really to provide 10 years of certainty about what the property taxes will be for some very unique assets. Um, as they mentioned, 
The baseball component has been reduced from eight fields to, or from 10 fields to eight fields. So there's a 20% reduction in the pilot we had previously agreed to for baseball. And I'll show that to you in a minute. And the home field, um, or the Margaritaville Hotel, home field outdoor, that one is due, uh, negotiated for the first time. And I will show you the schedule. So when you look at these components, when it comes to using industrial revenue bonds for purposes of certainty, these, this is exactly what the UG would get from those assets for the next 10 years. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll stop there. I think that's what I wanted to highlight as the changes in our development agreement. This is what the first amendment would contemplate. The other two agenda items you have after this are really res resolutions of intent that are about formalizing these industrial revenue bonds. So I'll stop there and stand for any questions. Before I take questions, Todd, could you, the aggregate total of the 800 on the side, is that roughly about nine, just under 9 million or is it under uh, $10 million? The aggregate number starting. Uh, if you totaled the call, the on, on the far right. I, I mean, if you want to do all three of them, that's fine. Uh, I'm just trying to get an aggregate count of the property or the pilot proceeds on these three developments in aggregate numbers. Oh, I notice see. that's not on there. I see. Not so if you yeah, so if you went through year one and you added, Chairman, lawyers don't do math. <laughs> Answer that is that about 1.3 million, Chairman? I think looks like that looks about right in the first year. What are they asking for all 10 years? Is that the question? Do, do, let's do one year first, right? If you if you took year one, I, I think Kurt's right, you've got about 1.3 million dollars when you total 241 for the indoor building, 85 for baseball, and 801 for the hotel and outdoor. That's about 1.3 annually. I was doing your 10 too, just not to be confusing when I was totaling it up, but. Oh yeah. So 1.1 to 1.3, depending on if you're in year one or year yeah. two, right? <laughs> so we're looking at over, we're looking at about 12, $13 million in that total Probably aggregate right. numbers. Is that right? Approximately, yes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Knapper. I think it's important that we see the, the numbers as they, uh, in the aggregate amount, so the public knows uh, what kind of money we're talking about here. Okay, gentlemen, if you're done with your presentation, I'll now ask uh, if there's any questions from, or comments from the commission. Commissioner Townsend. Oh, thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, thank you for your uh, continued interest in development in Wyandotte County, but do have some questions. I'll start with the easiest one. I can barely read my own notes. Start with the new piece, the immersive theater project. Couple of questions. Um, my only experience with the immersive theaters have been like the Van Gogh setups and those types of things. It's not a whole lot of them in a year. So do you see this as something that would be used year round? I also saw in uh, some of the paperwork, there was a talk about a theater. And I, I wasn't quite sure in what manner of theater would that compete with our movie theater already out there? So we'll start with those questions. Thank you for the question. And no, it would not compete with your traditional movie theater whatsoever. Um, I believe as Todd, um, reference he's been to the meow wolf and again this is not meow wolf we like to think of as version 2.0 better um this would be activated and this would be year round uh 365 and the our partner <clears throat> excuse me in this endeavor dimensional innovations they came up with this three paragraph summary of what this is envisioned i did not read it earlier in the um, in respect of time, but I'm happy to read this real quick as to how they would describe it. Um, so if, give me 60 seconds and I'll try not to bumble through here. Uh, a movie ticket like no other. Atlas 9 is the Midwest premier immersive art museum. 
driven by an intriguing narrative centered around a movie theater that has been magically transformed, visitors have a ticket to explore an artistic escape from reality. Spanning two floors and over 30,000 square feet, the experience invites visitors to explore multiple installations, interactives, and integrated live performance where local and regional artists channel cinematic themes to conjure a surreal and captivating world. All are meticulously crafted to artist artistically bring to life everything that we've loved about the movies. Food, beverage events, and retail options are all woven into the experience, replete with a full themed concession, concession stand and a time traveling speakeasy where the bartenders play the part. A 250 seat movie theater auditorium offers countless opportunities, not just for screenings and film festivals, but a stage performance venue for live events. Not simply an escape room or a haunted house, in light years beyond a selfie museum, Atlas Nine represents a new wave of immersive entertainment that blurs the line between reality and fiction. They are not showing first run movies. This is, again, I, I would ask to, for you to Google me, Al Wolf, when you leave here, and um, I'd be happy to advance to you after tonight a, a few of the uh, images that are still in works. I'd hated to share them tonight because they're not finished, but this is not where you're going to go see the same movie you'd see at AMC or any other theater like that. Um, not possible. And that's why I was wondering, I'm not familiar with Meow Wolf. I will Google it. Uh, if, if there is a year-round market for the variety of things that you're talking about, Oh, we believe there is, and I think if you look at the existing three Meow Wolf facilities, kind of as the template, uh, one in Denver, one in Santa Fe, and one in Las Vegas, they are year-round. And we actually think the fact that this is year-round and it happens to be indoors, I think on the hot, muggy days of summer when kids are playing baseball, uh, this is a great place to go inside and see something unique uh, in winter. Uh, same thing, a great place to come inside. So this is absolutely 100% year-round activity. Commissioner Townsend, one other thing to Google, because I can tell you're, you have interest in this. Dimensional Innovations, if that's not somebody that kind of jumps to the forefront of your mind, it's a national, frankly, international. Uh, I, I don't even know what to call them. They, they can have it this, you can, they, if you can think it, they can, they can build it. Uh, Tucker Trotter is the CEO. You Google their website and, and look at some of the projects they've done in stadiums across the United States and how they're renowned around the world. They're based in, in, in the metro and there are partners signed up ready to do this. I think that will be the other piece of the puzzle for you when you see who's involved. Okay, and what's that name again? Dimensional Innovations. Oh, I did see that. The, their symbol you can see on I-35 there at their head. It's a big DI on the building. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Um, Council, you were talking about um, the special assessments uh, as part of the package now. Uh, $2 ticket fees. I'm not sure I can write quickly enough on which activity. $30 resort fee. I imagine that's for the um, hotel. Is that $30 per night? Good. That kind of resort? Per, per night per room. Per night per room. Okay. And who will see that money? How does that play into um, the financing package, this, those special assessments? The, whether it's the ticket tax or the resort fee, they will be, and I'm, I'm summarizing at a very high level from my own brain, uh, they'll be packaged with the rest of the CID. Uh, underwritten by the third party underwriter and a third party analyst that would do the projections and they would be sold in the same, more or less the same package as the balance of the CID. Okay. In addition to the 2% sales tax on any sales that's on any good or service on in, in affiliated with any of these projects. Yes. And any, anything that is eligible for retail sales tax. All right. Um, thank you. Um, I may have some questions later, but that's a good start off for me. Thank you. Anyone else? No other questions coming? Mr. Uh, 
Mr. Haley. Thank you. This is a comprehensive review and thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I'm impressed um, to look at the expansion that has been outlined and um, I, as was stated by the previous commissioner, I, I probably don't know what to ask. I wish I did. When we look at the shift from the RRBs and where they will fall, um, I, I don't exactly know where we go from here with the ask. And this may be a question more for um, staff um, in terms of access. Um, I know that other venues have bifurcation of fees. We look at, you know, the uh, that if there are any way to generate uh, and to incentivize participation by uh, Wyandotte County taxpayers for access. Uh, I know that's been done in some other venues. I think right offhand of the sporting venues in um, Jackson County, Missouri, where um, first come and certainly um, opportunities are afforded to uh, their tax base to participate. I don't know how or if that has ever come up or even if it's feasible to do so that the Wyandotte County taxpayer is um, incentivized, I guess, um, because of um, uh, uh, being a proud participant, a, a taxpayer in assisting with this to, to participate. It may not have come up before. It may not be anything that could be a part of that, but I just uh, thought I would throw that out because again, full disclosure, I don't know much of whatever else I could ask about. <laughs> I really appreciate the question. Let, um, though this isn't new, this is a part of our development agreement from last year. There are some commitments to the local community and opportunities for Wyandotte County citizens that I'd love to remind you about. Um, this says that during, and I'm I'm going back to section article eight of our original development agreement. Uh, one thing is when it comes to admission to home field, the home field building, home field outdoor and home field baseball, uh, all of those ad admission prices will be at least 20% off for Wyandotte County residents. Um, secondly, the developer is working on, and you guys may want to give us an update about this. They are working with the local school districts, all of the local school districts, um, to set uh, to make to provide special opportunities for these sports-related facilities to the students of our various school districts. Um, there is also a commitment to provide at least 500 tickets annually to the UG Parks and Rec Department for free admission to the home field outdoor facility part of the project. Um, and then finally, the commitment to push hotels is also a part of this list. So th there were some things that we negotiated previously that were about prioritization and access to the local community. And those, those remain in place. The, ho the component with the school district is, is a thing that they have been working on. It really has to be finalized before I, we go out and do this next round of bonds. So, um, Mr. Ch I'm sorry, excuse me, what did I say? That is completely accurate. And the agreements with the school districts, uh, last information I received is they had been sent to the school districts for review uh, and I mean, hopefully execution. And then additionally, late last year, November, December, um, Homefield delivered approximately, and hard to peg the exact dollar value, but a couple hundred thousand dollars in textbooks that we were able to get our hands on and we delivered them with our baseball club and other volunteers to all of the high schools in Wyandotte County. So, and again, that's outside of our um, obligations or commitments in the development agreement, but it's something we thought was of great community benefit um, and that we wanted to do. And our, our head of operations took that on and made it happen. Thank you for that. Um, in terms of, and I do appreciate the initial assessment or, of what the tax, I, will, I think you said 1.5. Um, has there been a run or looked at what some of the other property tax, real property tax assessment might be, or when, when might those be forthcoming? On the- 1.5. Yeah. On the components we're bringing to the table, I'm, yeah. if I'm understanding the question. Yes. Uh, Obviously, it depends on how quickly we're able to get them through planning and get them built. But everything, and as Mr. LaSalle pointed out, in the development agreement amendment, we will have 
dates that he's called out in there when we must deliver these components. And they're not, these aren't dates 10 years out. They're in the relatively immediate term that we have to execute on all these potential new developments. So it, it is in the near term, not the long term. Adding one layer of detail, which I think you might be looking for as well. So with respect to Live Nation and the Atlas 9 Museum, those will be worked out in, I don't know if you want to call it round two, but remember I said two steps, step two this summer. So you'll, you'll see, Ms. Kelly, you'll see that this summer. We'll work that through a staff and through the normal processes. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Chair, gentlemen, what, I, I didn't quite catch the further commitment from the state, uh, Starbond, or what exactly. I, I, I missed that. It glazed over me a bit. I made a brief reference to it. That's why you're, I, I didn't really go into any detail. And I look over at Mr. LaSala uh, and Mr. Waters because we work very closely with UG when we do Starbond deals with our third partner, which is the state of Kansas. So anytime we're proposing new projects or additional revenues or changing use of revenues, we always, the three parties, the state being the third, get together and talk about it. And frankly, and it's understandable, uh, it just takes longer when you're working with the state at that level. So that's what I was referring to. That process will play out over the next few months. I would only offer a little more detail. The, the original development agreement called for $150 million worth of star bonds, 130 in the first issuance, and then another $20 million issuance. When we actually went out last summer, we issued 115 as opposed to 130 give or take. So it is still on the boards pursuant to the development agreement right now that we could do we could do another $35 million of star bonds. The developer is really telling you, hey, with these additional these additional components, many of which are star bond type components, there, there's a desire to go back to the state and talk about additional star bonds on top of the $150 million that are currently authorized right now. And Mr. Peterson is absolutely right. All of that is done in concert with our partners at the state. Um, and I, sh I should have said this earlier. Uh, we also previewed all of this, this first amendment and what's going on here with baseball and these new components with the Department of Commerce. So they have seen all of this, including a, a copy of this amendment. We are always careful to be transparent and forthcoming with, with the department there because they're your very good municipal partner. I appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. From the beginning, this has been a really exciting project. I still think it is a really exciting project. It's a very complicated project. I'm disappointed that I didn't get the PowerPoints until this afternoon. I'm disappointed that I didn't get these cost benefit analyses until this afternoon. I did get the development agreement, the, the wording of that. I was able to go through it and pick out relevant details. But in something as complex as this, something I've asked for from the beginning is, give me time to thoughtfully consider these materials before you ask me to make a thoughtful decision, please. Mr. Peterson, I'm glad you remember that I like the fact that everything out here is paying property tax. I don't remember pounding the table, but I have been pretty insistent that one of the benefits we get besides all of the amenities, besides all of the sales tax, besides all of the visitors, we get the real property tax benefits from this. And so I just have a few questions like Senator Haley. I will undoubtedly be back for more questions as I continue to think and evolve here. Um, first of all, what is the CID percentage? I'm sorry, the CID is 2%. What will that bring the total sales tax up to in the CID boundaries? Right now it's 9.125%. So we would add the 2%, which would be 11.125%. So that really would not be out of line with other areas that have similar CIDs in the Legends Village West area, correct? Right, and just even more broadly, I, I kind of thought someone, this is a good question, so I thought about it, and I went and counted, and in our state, we have 220 2% CIDs, and the latest numbers were 92 of those have rates above 11%. Okay. So when there's something compelling, there's, there's a pathway for this being done, both here, statewide. So we have several benefits that accrue from this CID. First of all, it enhances the project. 
Second of all, it's only visitors to that site who actually end up paying it. And third, it is not out of line with other tax rates that you'd find in various districts within Village West area. Good. Um, we're proposing, however, to bond the CID proceeds in advance. I know we're not gonna back those, but if you'd elaborate a little bit, does, does issuing those have any impact on our credit rating and what we might pay for borrowing for actual UG related projects? I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer this question and I'm gonna also offer, if Kevin Wempe, your bond counsel wants to come up, if I do this wrong, I'd ask Kevin to come up and <laughs> make sure that he weighs in here too. The answer is it shouldn't because you are only, it's, it's a special obligation. It's only a pledge of the revenues from the pro You are not putting your full faith and credit behind these bonds. However, Commissioner, your question is timely. There are cases in the country in the last year where municipalities who have done something similar and the bonds go south, there is at least one rating agency who has been giving municipalities, at least in a couple of cases, a black eye on their credit rating as a result of that, despite the fact that the municipality had not guaranteed the bonds, had not put its full faith and credit behind. Them. Now, the other two rating agencies have not followed suit and done that, but there are at least a couple of examples out there that your financial advisor, your bond counsel, that we are worried about. And so when I tell you that there is risk related to bonding versus pay as you go, I that, that's what it is. Now, there, there are trends in the marketplace and I, you know, the, the, the answer to your question is it shouldn't, but of late for a couple, at least a couple of municipalities, it has, it has hurt their credit. So that might be something that we want to take into account every time from now forward that we consider something like bonding for a CID or because we we're also going to issue the IRBs here again, not back them, but issue them. And does that then just compound our problem? The IRBs shouldn't have any impact on your credit rating uh, because those you're not going out and selling publicly in the marketplace. It's, it's really a very different risk profile and we do not have the same concerns when it comes to the IRBs versus packaging CID bonds or star bonds and going out to market publicly. And Todd, can I add just on top of that, just to put a point on what you said, which is no concern because these, in this instance, we're doing buy your own bonds, which means the developer buys its own bonds. So I'm just adding to the fact in this particular case, this is not, yeah. we're, not wor we're not worried at all. Okay, so the there's, totally there's totally no compounding here. Correct. You put back up onto the screen uh, the um, pilot schedule. And again, just to make sure that we're clear, this is not the BPU payment in lieu of tax, but a property tax payment in lieu of tax. Correct. And what I want to know is, oh, I'm sorry, we'd already taken that down. Well, sir. All the way at the end. That's, uh, no, keep going. I think that's Oops. the one. I did it. Go back right there. So, for example, in year one, we have broken out, and I'll go to the far right column. We have broken out that the uh, themed hotel will pay 8015 in property tax as the first year of that schedule. Would that 8015 be similar to the amount of tax that a similarly assessed property would pay in that year? Footnote, because I'll lose it, and then we go to the main point. When we show these numbers, I'm looking at, at my fellow attorneys, there's certain mill levies, school district, capital, outlay mill levies that are carved out. So just using rough numbers, that 800 in the first year could be as high, you know, could be 850 to 875. It's, it's a material amount of money. So I just wanted to say it. And, and I'll go back to some of the documents that we received this afternoon that do spell that out a little bit in some of the tables here, but I haven't had a chance to look through those yet. So I, I, I figured that that was the case, but just with whatever mill levy we're applying, 
is 8015 what this property would ordinarily pay? I mean, the closest you can get to, again, it's we all know it's unique. it's unique in the state, but we looked across the street and Great Wolf in tax paid last year, paid about 895. So right in there, I mean, you can speak to the credit markets that they're telling you about comp, but I mean, is that, to be fair, the closest thing to? I think that's the closest comp. So if we're all in it, what you said, 850, 875 could be as high as 900. And our closest comp that we can come up with for 2022 was Great Wolf at 890, 899, whatever your number was. We were trying to comp off of that. Okay. So we can be confident that even though we're applying a pilot with a predictable change year to year, that we're at least starting at a payment that is as close as we can find to a comparably assessed property. That, that is correct. And again, our comp has been on many levels has been Great Wolf. And that's what we were. When we are approached by investors and lenders and they look at Great Wolf as the closest thing to a comp and they look at all levels of the income stream and they focus on the property taxes. Again, that's why we try to comp off of them as we think it is as close to a comparable as we can possibly get. Fantastic. Well, as Mr. Peterson knows, I've always looked at the fact that these properties are paying property tax as a real benefit because that is money that doesn't get funneled back into the development. It's money that we can take for the provision of city services to our residents. And so I think it's really important that this is how this is built, that it be uh, money that's available to us. Mr. Chair, at this time, that's all the questions I have. Thank you, Commissioner McKernan. Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, gentlemen. Um, this has been very informative, and I am excited. Um, I have not been to Meow Wolf, but I am familiar with the uh, uh, museum and the amazing um, amenity that they offer in various kind of touristy areas in Vegas and Denver and what have you. Um, I do have some questions. I know that with these added amenities and what's kind of the changes, right, of kind of the baseball developer, it has changed kind of the, the details of the agreement. Has there been any contemplation on the community benefit portion? I know, uh, Todd, you had kind of mentioned what it was in the previous agreement, but now that we have new amenities, I think we may want to revisit that portion of the agreement as well. Has that been contemplated? We have not made any changes to that. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Well, I, I think there are some things that could be uh, given, you know, if we're going to talk about a museum and big shots and what have you, that if we want access for, I'm particularly thinking about our residents on the east side, who may not have access to uh, transportation or, or, or it may be slightly uh, expensive for them to access these amenities. Um, I would like to see some sort of uh, language codified within the contract that would allow that access, whether it be a discount or something of that measure. Um, the same kind of structure that you all had for the school districts in regards to baseball and Margaritaville. Let's just apply that to um, Atlas 9 and Big Shots and what have you. That way we can get field trips and things of that sort there. Did we have a response? Great idea. And, and for the, my only comment would be for the assets or the uses that we control, such as Atlas 9, and we will be the landlord under the uh, Live Nation Sports Arena. We absolutely have no issue, and maybe the best time, if not now, would be in version 2.0. Kurt referenced uh, earlier, and, and Todd uh, elaborated on for third party users like Big Shots, where we are selling them the land and they are the owner and developer. There's no way for us to agree to that. I mean, I would say, and again, I can't speak for them, but if everyone else around there is working towards that same type of goal, I don't think it would be out of bounds to speak with them about that, but we can't, I can't contractually obligate big shots to, uh, to do, to offer that. But for the assets we control, we have no issue in working with um, council and staff to come up with what that formula is for the next round of attractions that we own or operate. 
Yeah, I mean, and even just having the conversation with them as you had before about being partners. And, and I know in, they want to be a great partner to the community and to the project. And I, I don't foresee that being a difficult conversation with them, but I certainly can't bind or speak on them. I'm yeah, happy yeah. to make the introductions and, and push the ball as hard as we can. Awesome. Yeah, I, w I wouldn't want you to commit to something that you couldn't honor, but I, I do appreciate that honesty. And I think with Atlas 9, so we have a lot of artists within our community that I think are really looking for opportunities. Perhaps this could be one where there could be some sort of partnership and we can give them the opportunity to um, whether display their art or we can um, teach right uh, our, our students or our youth about the various uh, professions associated with um, Atlas Nine and those experiences, but I'm a big, big proponent uh, of that. Um, another idea would be um, recruitment heavily within Wyandotte County. I know if we cannot mandate hiring requirement requirements, maybe a um, you know uh, uh, going to um, various entities with workforce partnerships and, and others to ensure that our residents are know about the jobs that are available and are able to uh, put in an application. So those are the things that I would like to see since we are adding on and <laughs> the UG is putting a considerable amount of investment. I would like to see some of that codified as well. We love the idea and I think we've tried to be a good community partner, not only within the bounds of the development agreement, but outside of those actual written words as well. It would certainly welcome the opportunity to expand upon that relationship and, and communication with you. Awesome, awesome, thank you. And then um, for the special assessments, um, that would be in addition to the market value, right, of entry, right, for um, the, the $2 added, that would be in addition to, correct? Correct, so if the, and I'm making numbers up a little bit, but the if the ticket is $25, it'd be $27. And again, we've spoken with um, not only, you know, the the parties that would have the ticket tax, but also other parties that have the CID. And they see this not only in really all of metropolitan Kansas City, but other markets they're in as well and, and understand it. Uh, and again, we look at a lot of the users that we have, we'll be bringing people in from out of state, out of county. Uh, a lot of money will be coming in from out of state that we're paying this uh, versus uh, you know, people in state or in county. Awesome, awesome. Uh, my last, last question, Chair. Um, for the pilot payments and staff may be able to answer uh, these questions. Was there a particular formula or just remind me of kind of the rhyme and reason of how we come up with these particular numbers? We know that they're not market value property tax payments, um, but how did we come up with these numbers? Do you mind if I jump in? We, we believed that the uh, uh, Margaritaville Homefield Outdoor, we we comped off of the property tax being paid across the highway at Great Wolf. So we believe that is a, a market value, a comp. Okay. Uh, and that, that was that was our goal is just to have it predictable for the next 10 years. Uh, so we believe comping off Great Wolf is is a market number. I see. Okay, gotcha. For the 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 okay, your rhyme and reason for the pilot was just to look kind of across the street, right? To, to say, okay, just to have that. Awesome. Well, yeah, I, I would just like to see. I, I agree with with my colleague uh, Commissioner McKiernan of just getting more time to really digest this. I would also like to see if we're going to give more incentives and put more of our investment in. That I would like to see more from you all as a developer in, as far as community benefits, just so that we're both being good partners. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Stites. Stites, District 7. I guess I'll, I'm gonna switch gears on um, on what I was gonna start with. I got many notes here, but I think that the, they have already demonstrated what their, um, their civic contributions, they were not obligated to the nearly $200,000 worth of books that went to every high school in Wyandotte County. So I think they've, uh, they're actually demonstrating. I don't disagree because we have economically challenged areas in not just the Eastern part of Wyandotte County, but we have them in all three cities. And I think that everywhere that, uh, that we can help our Wyandotte County constituents um, access these amenities, I think it's good. Um, one thing, if you guys would um, go back to and I remember hearing Series A and Series B, and and I want to be real clear on it because if I'm not mistaken, Series A unified government is on the hook for right now. Is that right? 
or no, okay. no I, that's why I'm asking. No. If you're talking about the bonds, bonds. that we issue, it, no, we are. Those are special obligation bonds. You're talking about the home field star bonds. Or you're talking about the Schlitter bond, 2015 series. Yes. A. Okay. 2015. There, you're right. There were Series A and Series B bonds. The Series B bonds were the ones we were on the hook from okay. on, for. We took those bonds. They out. are gone. Right. right. That's Last summer sure. when we public ish, publicly right. issued. So yes, those Series B bonds where we had a general obligation pledge behind it, they have been repaid, refunded, fully amortized. They're gone. Okay, and that's what I wanted to. I, I wanted to make clear that. Uh, we are no longer as a unified government. We are no longer on the, and we were for quite some time on right. on the hook for those. And the developers have now stepped up, and and those have been. Absorbed. That's right. They were paid off as a part of the bond issuance we did last summer. If, if I if I may, could I make a point mm -hmm. on that? So, the former developer that had the Series A and B issue, they never asked for the B to B issue. That that's something that they wanted. And again, they're they're long gone. Uh, but those have been paid off in full. And even at the bond closing in May of 22, when the proceeds that the developer, um, what was forecast, came up $14 million short, the, the full Bs were still redeemed and paid in full. Okay, perfect. The development agreement for the uh, north of the river in Parkville they have the 92 rooms, right? I know that how we had it structured, um, that it was at Margaritaville and then Moinda County and then just local. Do they have, and I understand that they need, they have contractual obligations up there to steer, you know, and, and fulfill those 92 rooms. Are they also under that same, then we need to go to, what is that, Platte County? Does it need to be in the county, or can they then steer them to our project in Wyoming County? I'm going to ask Kurt to confirm this, but it's I believe it's the latter. Okay, it, it's the latter, and I, perfect. I didn't want to interrupt at the at the time, but teamwork in terms of explaining the, the the web that's out there. When PBR, in theory, because I think this is in theory going forward once we're built, in theory would hold a tournament in Parkville, then they're contractually obligated to push people to the 92 rooms that are right next to the fields, right? But the important point is that they intend PBR is making this their absolutely, you know, world-class headquarter fields here in Wyandotte County. And so in reality, what's going to happen is, and by the way, we're all turf, not to have a baseball coach. Those are nice fields, but they're partial turf. So we still get in Kansas City, we lose a lot of games there. Here in Wyandotte County, they're going to they're going to play and they're going to play and play and they have more fields here. This is the, the marquee field area. What they're going to do is their tournaments are so popular, they're a national operator, that they're going to bleed over and also use the Parkville fields. And what this development is, Todd explained it well, what the development agreement is saying is that, look, we understand when you do that and you're playing people over at Parkville, you got to do your 92 rooms. But to your point, after that, you're absolutely 100% back to your formula right with us for your tournament of filling the ones in the district the ones in the county and then lastly in the state and richard just because you have worked so closely with the pbr guys very quickly add and we can say it because they've said it so many times let's relay their cue on what we offer down here to their to their their players if you look at the intersection of the two freeways where they're located in the google where there's hotels and restaurants and amenities and you do a a, a, a mapping service. We're closer or the same time as where you're going to find any other large amenity to them. They are beyond excited to book the hotel room nights down here because we have all the amenities. There's no attractions up there. Uh, their, their first comment was all the bookings they're putting people in up by KCI, they're bringing them down here because of all the attractions we have. And from a time standpoint, mileage and driving time, we are as close, if not closer, than where they were putting people. So I, I and with their headquarters being in our building, and what one of our eight fields is a championship quality field, they're going to be, in our opinion, I mean, we'll be seeing more than, more than we can probably you know handle in a given summer with hotel room nights, uh, at our facility. Commissioner, there's one other. There's a sentence in here that I probably should have read at the beginning of this that puts an exclamation point on what you're asking. The last sentence about uh, in our 
First Amendment about this says, however, the developer is going to cause PBR to agree that its, its booking system will not promote the Creekside Hotel uh, unless and only if PBR is hosting a tournament that's large enough to require both home field baseball and Creekside Baseball Park to be engaged and only for such large tournaments requiring use of both facilities, PBR, PBR may not promote any non-Kansas hotels other than the Creekside Hotel. So okay. it, we've driven that point home contractually. Yeah, because we want to, I mean, we want to fill up our rooms in, 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 our, in our area for sure. So. Exactly. Okay. Um, I think it's interesting that in a, the original development agreement that Lake Point was um, identified as we need to be, we need to have a user that is like Lake Point, right? I mean, we, we call them out. Yeah. We name them. We do. We feel like that they are, they are the, they are it, right? Yep. And then, um, then we end up landing perfect game. And I think it's very unfortunate that uh, the way that these developers were treated by perfect game, that they've backed out of what they contractually obligated to, to do. But I, I, uh, commend the developer for not going out and getting somebody like Lake Point. They got Lake Point, right? We got the premiere. So congratulations. Perfect game. Shame on you. But I'm glad that we've got the better product. So I'm in full support of this. I look forward to it. It's in my district. And um, uh, I look forward to uh, seeing more things come out there. Thank you. David, Mr. Haley. Just a brief um, uh, postscript on some of the things. You mentioned the uh, event space um, out there. There's been some, some said 55,000, it would house 55,000. Please just touch on that again. Was that? Are we talking about the 55,000 square foot? If Live Nations Arena, the it's a sports and a live music venue. Is that what you're asking about? That only uh, a sports venue is it only sports, sports, live music, and then uh, frankly, the in you know, the Margaritaville Resort has conference space in it as well. And we have, uh, and the, the agreement would say that if that conference space is filled up, we can overflow into the arena for additional capacity. So we think it's a multi-use arena that could be used again for sports, live music, and other events. Did you happen to know offhand the square footage of the um, of of that area? Uh, that building's fifty-five thousand square feet. And the spillover. Well, the the live music sports arena is fifty-five thousand square feet. The conference space inside Margaritaville is approximately twelve thousand five hundred square feet. Sixty-seven. Seven thousand. It's just, I mean, those combined are of size. And then if you look at outdoor areas, and again, we realize not every day you could host an event outdoors, but when you look at the outdoor area around Margaritaville and Homefield Outdoor, number one, it's pretty cool. Number two, it is it's expansive. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner McKeeran. Thank you. I agree with Commissioner Stites. I do think that there is a lot of a very positive benefit that could come from moving forward with this. Uh, I do have a question though about, so I'm, I'm trying to read quickly through the cost benefit analyses here. And it appears that if I cut to the chase, each taxing entity has a positive benefit to cost ratio in excess of the desired 1.3. So whoever prepared this report, would I assume that they believe that there is a net gain for all taxing entities? That's correct, Commissioner. We use an outside consultant to prepare all of these for every IRB, and both of these came back positive. Great. I do definitely want a net gain. One thing that's interesting here is that it says that this report assumes, no, I'm sorry. The pilot to be in place for any property tax payment except for the school capital outlook. Tell me about is there, a, is there a difference stratification for USD? By the way, what school district is this, 500 or 204? It's in multiple school districts, isn't that right, Patrick? I thought it was all within 500. 
I think it's all within 500 as well. Oh, I thought that. Is it all 500? Okay. So do I read? School districts benefit. Just that's why we're getting. That you're, that Todd is answering the question that we made sure all the school districts in the county, right, are helped. But your question is to work physically is 500. Yes. Okay. So it is 500. But do I read this correctly that they're, the school district will not follow the same pilot schedule? And this is my cryptic comment. And I'm, I'm jumping in because I touched on this, but we always don't want to test the chairman's patience here as we get into the gross weeds until you say, go ahead, go ahead. State law says that. And I have the, the boss in the back of the bond council back here, but state law says that when the unified government or any other municipality approves predictable pilots abatement depends on the circumstance that there's a part of the mill levies that are held harmless. It's like things just go on like you didn't even do what you're doing over here. And that is the school district and it's, it's eight mills. And so when I said, if you remember on the screen, rough numbers, $800,000 pilot for Margaritaville Homefield outdoor. But I said, just to be clear, we don't know exactly 850, 875, maybe a little higher because I have to, I'm adding, I'm doing the math. I'm adding on that eight mils that's held harmless. We cut the $800,000 schedule, but state law says you still have to pay the eight mils, which is another 50, 75, whatever. That was that conversation. Okay. So the school district in that case is really getting full benefit from full valuation as if they're part of their mill levies pilot. For, for part of their mill levies because their mill levies are, are much higher. Exactly. But exactly. proportional to, to every, I mean, proportional to their mill levy, they are still getting full benefit from this. We are choosing to set the pilot up for the benefit of gaining the amenity, gaining the jobs, gaining the tourists, gaining the sales tax, all the gains that we will make. But the school district, while still benefiting from those, will also benefit from the full application of their mill levy against these dollars. From those eight mills, precisely right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Townsend, District 1. Um, going back to the um, agreement here, it seems like I noted that there were, there were obligations for the partners, the developing partners, uh, for the hotel, for... Um, I think the theater, maybe the golf, uh, not so much Live Nation, but for those operators, if this goes forward to operate for 15 years, so there won't be other entities coming in. And I guess this is really relevant based on what just happened with, uh, was that the perfect game? Yeah, sure. gentlemen did pass though, right? I'm sure what when we're doing these in particular where we're going out for bonds we are trying to get a covenant a, an agreement from the developer to continuously operate these new assets for as long as possible for the things that this developer has control of particularly when it's uh Mar the margaritaville hotel mm -hmm. and this partnership they have with dimensional innovations for atlas nine they can can commit to us that they will stay open no matter what, for a certain period of time. And that period of time is 15 years for those two assets, Margaritaville and Atlas 9. And as a Margaritaville and as Atlas 9. That's I, correct. I that's really important. I remember that type of uh, term. It gives certainty when we did the theater out there, which seemed a long time ago now. So I just want to make sure I was clear It's on important that. to us when, whenever we can get it. And they, they will tell you when it comes to big shots, they don't have control over that. But so for ones where they have control, we've been able to secure a 15 year covenant, which is pretty good. Okay. Um, the other thing, uh, Mr. LaSalle, you talked about, I just want to make sure I understand we're still having a CID for some or all of these projects because then we're talking about financing by bond. And so other than the uncertainty to a credit rating of something goes south, what would what is the risk to the UG by move, by going from the CID, if it's not existing, uh, to the bond financing? No. I would tell you it's 
it's it's really two things. Mm-hmm. Uh, the credit rating thing is important and worth noting. The other thing, the other reason that the UG has a general preference for pay as you go is you remain in control. When you bond these revenues, you have to pledge it all up front. And no matter what happens after that, the bondholders have access to that revenue stream. Mm-hmm. When we do development agreements where we've got pay as you go, we continue to hold that money, we pay it out slowly over time. So in a development agreement where somebody closes in spite of their 15 year covenant or um, doesn't rebuild after a fire, a bunch of the ongoing obligations we have, we have the ability to shut off the money. And here you, you won't have it. Once you, issue bonds and pledge that revenue, you're no longer in control of that money. As and when that money comes in, it is necessarily pledged to bondholders and you can't ever pull it back from them. You can't. So it provides you less control over the project over the 22 year life of the CID versus a vehicle where it's purely pay as you go. Commissioner, may I add to that? Absolutely. It is just additional what Todd is saying is that when you are um, wanting to dig in, when um, I was gonna, I was gonna make a joke about if you need to fall asleep, but if if you were wanting to get I'm deep, wide awake, we're talking about this level. Okay, okay. yeah, there there are what's called disbursement uh, uh, conditions that say that the bonds close, a, a number of big bond buyers come in, and so the bond proceeds are sitting there before the developer for these various CID projects can actually get their hands on that money. It's sitting there. It's up front. There is a whole list. It's probably a page or, or something like that in the development agreement amendment that spells out you need to get you know all your plans approved, you need vertical construction. And it goes, I'm not going to say them all off the top of my head, but it goes through. And the reason that Mr. LaSala and Mr. Waters and the UG attorneys put all those in there is to make sure that the unified government is going to get what they bargained for before the bond money can be received. Uh, the only thing Mr. LaSalle referred to after that is if there's a 15-year covenant or something like that. But other than that piece of it, the rest of it, we get, there's a lot of negotiation, uh, gets handled through those disbursement conditions, which if you want, I'm sure Todd can talk a long time about those if you want. But I wanted to at least get that. It's kind of a diamond with a lot of facets. I'm speaking to a different facet that Todd did. He's right. He's right. There's multiple things going on here. There's the construction risk and getting what you're asking for in the first place. And we do as much as we can to make sure that happens when we're in a bonded environment. And then the, the part I started with was well, what happens after the thing opens and it's delivered to us initially. And the place where you lose control is after the thing open gets built initially and open. It's, it's control over the facility, over the remaining life of the vehicle. That's that's the place where this is about losing. Uh, you know, losing. I'm going to say losing control. That's not strictly true. You still have these agreements, mm-hmm. but your remedies are different when you're no longer holding the money hostage. Oh. Can I make one comment? And just on one property, the Margaritaville and the Home Field Outdoor is about $150 million dollars. That is a staggering amount of money in the CID component in that pales in comparison to the amount of private capital being invested in that project. So uh, yes, people, there there is some risk that goes around, but for the parties putting in in excess of $100 million, uh, they've got a lot of reasons to make it work. And, And I think the list of users I rattled off since 2013 and the status of the drone videos and the other construction going on. I, I think you have in the home field group, I think you have some proven performers, again, in my opinion. But again, $100 million or more just on one project, that's a lot of private capital. Thank you, gentlemen, for that. I mean, these are just questions worth uh, asking at this level. And I want to echo something that uh, Commissioner McKeren had brought up. I think for something this level, I would like to see from staff a preview uh, like a three on three, I think that would benefit all of us um, for something this detail. And we may have the opportunity to do that when part two or before part two is introduced. I think that may be helpful. Um, so I look forward to these new additions. Um, I would appreciate the consideration of 
uh, what can be done as a community benefit, maybe in the way of tickets or something to uh, be considered for people, uh, citizens of Wyandotte County, east of 635. Um, I think that would be um, something worthy of this project. And I wanna say that I know that Mr. Napper and his group um, hasn't been formally announced yet, but they have taken that into consideration and some other areas of development related to home fields that will come up that will benefit um, District 1. So thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. McKiernan. Thank you, Chair. Just one other thing. Um, if this does move forward to full commission, then there will be a period of time where I can look through all these documents in a little bit greater depth. I would just say for future meetings, if we were to get these documents prior to the committee meeting, then we can make relatively more progress in terms of our discussion here, leaving less to be discussed and potentially uh, considered, debated, voted on at full commission. So anything we can do to accelerate uh, the delivery of these, I think would just be beneficial from the standing committee moving on forward. But should we move this forward to full commission, we will have a period of time to do that ask additional questions and fold that into the discussion then. So I think that that ultimately will work out. Okay, no other questions. Uh, Chairman Burroughs, I do have a few. I would just like to say that this is kind of reminds me of a bundled bill that we made rules about in the legislature. It's got good and bad in it, or maybe not so good in it. And hearing some of the comments come from the committee uh, I do see that uh, we have some reputation risk in our credit rating that could be at risk for us and an increase in fees and an increase in taxes. Uh, Mr. Knapper, do you believe that the $30 is, is that going to, that's not going to uh, force you out of market for a resort style environment, will it? We do not think it will, neither do the financial partners that are investing in the project, and neither does Margaritaville as a large corporate international resort. Okay. Wonderful. I just wanted to make sure that we're not pricing ourselves out of the market in order to make the CID work. Uh, the next question I might have is, uh, Mr. Peterson, you gave comments that 92 projects uh, were around us that had over 11% uh, CID or our tax base, sales tax base. How many of those projects are close to us in the metropolitan area that we might find ourselves in competition with in light type sporting venues? Because we do have a number of sporting venues within the metropolitan area that are pretty close to one another. I didn't go that deep. That's something we can, I can work with staff on to, for, to collaboratively prepare for you, Chairman, between now and full commission if you'd like to see it. Those are just the raw numbers that I counted off of building a spreadsheet from the state publishes all this. So I just didn't commit those level of details to memory. Well, I appreciate that. And the only reason why I brought that up is because you went through the numbers and I just wanted to see how many of those are in competition with, with the projects being proposed before us tonight. And I did want to talk about the uh, monies that I asked to aggregate number because I think it's important that taxpayers realize that they're going to get nearly $13 million in revenue that the developer knows what they have to pay through the pilot. And I do appreciate uh, Commissioner McKiernan bringing, it's not the pilot that you see on the utilities. And I still wish we would change the name of that because it does get quite confusing. Uh, it was requested that we look at doing something for the individual districts. I would encourage us to be mindful that this is a community-wide tax dollar that are going into this. So I would hope that all Wyandotte County districts would be included and considered when it comes to opportunity for our kids and or job creation. And the uh, Mr. LaSala, uh, this is a new thing that I haven't heard of, and that's bonding CIDs. And we're doing away with the pay go, which I think was a very appropriate approach in the initial agreement. And I think if it was, was a 70, 30 or 60, 40, that had to be met in the initial agreement. Yeah, your memory is spot on. When it comes to the Starbond part of the equation, uh, it's 60-40 for the first phase of Starbonds, uh, 60 private, 40 public. When we go to issue a second a series of bonds, it's 70 private, 30 public. Right. Thank you. I just wanted to ensure we're on that. The, but now it's nearly 50-50. Well, um, 
even when I, I don't think so, it, it'll still be short of 50 50 and we still have the 50 50 test in our development. It will never be north of 50 50. Uh, my math on that suggested that we were above 40 when you combine star bonds and CID, but it's I, we're still not right up against 50. You're still in the low 40s, I think. And, and I, I appreciate the developer bringing forward six individual projects of quality magnitude. I mean, those are every one of them is a hook for a major development. So I commend them from doing that. But I also see that the three, the three of the projects proposed here aren't supposed to start and the commencement date is in the contract, July of 2025, I believe. Those are the completion dates, right? The complete, hey, here, I'll get, I'll get it. I believe the completion dates for those are all in July of 2025. I think they're all supposed to start in July of 2024. Yeah, uh, yeah, the commencement of construction uh, on July of 2024. So the CID will be in place uh, now and they'll start drawing the proceeds once construction's up and they start submitting their expenses from the bonding issue portion yeah. that we're going to bond. Your, your timing question is a really good question when it comes to the CID. We would form it now establish it now relatively right now and but you wouldn't have to start collecting um, at that time with CID you can peg a date in the future and I'm sure the developer will want to do this in a way that really maximizes the proceeds and coordinates with the opening of these facilities so we'll, we probably we won't start collecting right away it'll be around the time these things open um, and then it runs 22 years from yeah, now. Yeah, I was going to say most of them do run 22 years. And so that's not any different than any other project that we've worked on that has this type of. Uh, that's uh, right. Go ahead. No, I, you're absolutely correct. Yep. One other item, if I may, uh, we talked about the downgrade that could occur if there's uh, any kind of default or shortness of revenue proceeds to meet the CID requirement that could hamper our, uh, I call it reputation risk. As a, as a government, is there anything in the contract? I know this is a new item. We may want to consider a some kind of uh, uh, bonding benefit that if should that uh, downgrade occur, uh, that th this is just moving forward. I'm not saying it needs to be done with this project, but if this is something that's going to be used coming forward, we may want to put some protection in it to ensure that they, that if the development does not meet the proceeds projection, and our reputation risk, and it costs us more to borrow money moving forward, that somebody has to pay that or re remedy that for us as a government. It's, tough, it's, it's tax dollars that the public deserves to have protected. I, I, I hear where you're coming from, uh, and we'll certainly look at that and talk about that, but it, it, that one's tough to do, but yeah. we hear, we totally hear you, we'll, we'll look at it. And uh, two other comments, if I may, and, uh, if I remember correctly, it was stated that you have talked with the state to ensure that they are aware of the additional items. And I know the, that uh, Star Bonds is a very uh, wonderful economic development tool provided it's utilized properly. And I'm sure they will keep their eyes on the project moving forward. But these are stellar projects. I do commend the developer for bringing this type of development forward. And I'm anxious about seeing something uh, occur out there when it's fit. Uh, been been sitting around. The um, one other thing, if I may, uh, I want to bring to the committee's attention that on page nine of the development agreement, section F, there is no UG guarantee or credit enhancement. The UG shall not be required in any way to guarantee or lend its credit to secure the CID bonds. Now, that is a question that's been requested here this evening, and it's spelled out in the contract. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. Okay. Wonderful. Well, there's um, one. The only other thing is, does the CID enhance the developer's equity position to draw down additional star bonds? Uh, no, no. I, I, I get what you're asking. That, again, is about the public-private ratio. The, the CID money is not public money. It's or it is not private money. It's public. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions, committee? Okay, seeing none, I'll ask the clerk uh, if there's any comments that were received from the public. 
No comments received. Thank you. I'll now recognize a member of the public who wish to address the committee. I'll ask the clerk if there are any hands raised by the public who wish to speak. No hands raised. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak? You will be given up to three minutes to make your comments. Please come to the podium, state your name and city of residence for the record. Let the record show no one step forward. Thank you. Committee, thank you, Mr. LaSala, Mr. Knapper, Mr. Peterson. We sincerely appreciate the transparency and the full disclosure that you brought forward this evening in reference to this project. With that, I would now, this is an action item. I would entertain a motion. It's in my district. I make the motion to approve and move it to a uh, full commission. McKeon and second. We have a motion and a second. No comments. Clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, committee. Sincerely appreciate all your help. Thank you. Item, Commissioner Stites. May 25th. May 25th. Um, I'm sure that uh, Sorry. Figure I talk loud enough, but sorry. Um, but I appreciate the thoroughness tonight and that uh, that uh, the, the full commission will probably have some questions also um, if they didn't get answered tonight. So thank you again. Hey, yeah, you bet. Yeah, you have yeah. two other you have two other agenda items right after this. These are the resolutions of intent that are about the industrial revenue bond financing, those certainty IRBs. First for Margaritaville Hotel and Home, home Field Outdoor. The second one is Home Field Baseball. We'll have to run through the same format that we did just a minute ago. So this is the adoption of a resolution of intent to issue the industrial revenue bonds discussed this evening. And I'll recognize Patrick if he has any comments. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, no additional comments. Um, I believe it's uh, ready for uh, a motion if, so, if the committee so chooses. Do our conferees have any comments? No, Commissioner. Any comments from the commission? Okay, we'll move right along. I'll ask if there are any comments that were received from the public. No comments received. Thank you. I'll recognize a member of the public who wish to address the committee. I'll ask the clerk if there are any hands raised by the public who wish to speak. No hands raised. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak? They, you will be given up to three minutes to make your comments. Please come to the podium, state your name, and city of residence for the record. Let the record show no one step forward. Thank you, committee. And entertain a motion. This is an action item. Uh, it's motion to approve. Davis second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. David, you have a comment? I do. Haley? We stay exactly specifically because there are three so this is specifically item number two it's a it's a IRB. yeah it's a resolution of intent to issue the industrial revenue bonds for the margaritaville home field outdoor project and i believe in the thing it was referred to as the outdoor hotel so i'm assuming home field hotel so i'm assuming it's the margarita that's correct yes sir okay, thank you thank you Mr. okay so we have a motion and a second i'd ask clerk please call roll Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, committee. That takes us to item number three, which is a resolution. It's the resolution of intent to issue industrial revenue bo uh, bonds for the home field baseball amendments submitted by Patrick Waters, acting counsel. I'll recognize Patrick for any comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No additional comments. Okay. Conferees? Nothing for me. Okay. Committee? Well, seeing none, I'll ask the clerk if there's any received from the public. No comments received. Any uh, members with uh, online have their hand raised? No hands raised. Okay. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak to this item? We'll have the record show no one step forward. With that, I'll entertain a motion. Kieran in District 2, second. 
Clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Dites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, committee. Thank you, conferees. Thank you for your patience with us, Patrick. Thank you. Okay, we'll give Mr. Haley. Whatever happened with the um, with the field, uh, the turf for the field, I was not privy to that. I remember that's a previous discussion. I can't hear you, David. I'm sorry. I got this thing right behind me here. It's all right. It's for the Monarchs field and not for home field. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Conferred with commissioners. <laughs> I will allow our... <laughs> For our next item, it's going to be a resolution dealing with Kansas City, Kansas Community College. I'll wait and ask for a transition to occur. Uh, and at that time, if the individuals are wanting to step up, speak to the item, please, you're, this is the time to do so. What, 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 just, a, just a minute, Mr. Moser. Um, I just wanted, if you want to join us up here to speak about the project, I would just soon you'd be up here in front of us in case there's any questions anybody should have. Thank you for that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, committee, uh, item number four is authorizing the UG to enter into two real estate purchase agreements with Kansas City, Kansas Community College, submitted by Patrick Waters, Chief Counsel. And I'll recognize Patrick at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The unified government owns two properties just down the street, 600 State Avenue and 645 Nebraska Avenue. Um, these are in the general area where the community college is planning to uh, do their downtown campus. Um, after discussing with community college, uh, we believe that this um, land could be put towards a very good use with their downtown campus. This resolution would authorize the unified government to sell um, outright 600 State Avenue and then uh, a portion, uh, approximately half of 645 Nebraska, which is on the Eastern Edge by the Willie Gill Center. Um, the, we are working with the community college and their engineers to get that exact dividing line. We would do a lot split there. Um, and so, but we, we show in the resolution um, approximately where that lot split would occur. It's about, it's about the Eastern half of the property. Um, Dr. Uh, Mosher is here to uh, discuss a little bit about the, the uh, community college's uh, proposed use for the property. Yes, great. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight and talk about the progress that we are making on this on the uh, project. Um, this project has been going for approximately three years now. And um, when we hit January of 2023, we have achieved the fundraising efforts of raising $46 million for the downtown project. Um, it is a uh, public-private partnership with KCKCC, Swope Health, Community America Credit Union, and we're working very closely with USD 500 as well to provide dual enrollment for high school students at this site. Um, it will be approximately 100,000 square feet in total with the college owning the property and about 80% of the facilities. It is a commercial condominium association. So the other partners have ownership in their space as well with Swope Health having about 16.5% and Community America Credit Union owning about 3.5%. Um, we've been making great progress on this. We have done both the environmental phase one and phase two studies, the land surveying of the entire block going to the opposite sides of the roads um, is being conducted by BHC as we speak. Um, we are working with the Landmarks Commission and I presented a week ago tonight um, on the uh, adoption of a revised uh, selective deconstruction schedule for the 7th Street Church, which was approved. Um, and the land that we are looking at and requesting the transfer of um, is the addresses that Mr. Waters uh, identified. Those are extremely important to the project as they will allow for off street parking. Um, 600 State Avenue will be a small parking lot adjacent to the blue building that will continue to stand. 
um, and maybe repurposed as a, a food service or some other site or business for the community. Um, and then the 645 Nebraska up to about 20, 30 feet from the east side of Willow Gill will also produce uh, off street parking, which will be important for the project. Uh, approximately 80 to 90 parking spots, uh, dependent upon the layout um, and the islands and such that will be required to uh, put, it, put in this uh, facility. Uh, the time schedule is moving right along. We have hired our owner's rep, uh, Copagan Brooks. Uh, we've hired our architect, PGAV, um, and we are we were down at the site today, actually working through the church with a historical architect as well, identifying uh, historical elements that will be built into the project. Uh, selective deconstruction will start in the fall. Full construction, or full uh, demolition will begin in the winter and we look to go uh, full construction of the site beginning January, 2024 with an anticipated completion date of June of 2025, opening for the college in fall 2025. So this land would be extremely beneficial to the, not only this project, but the community that it will be serving in, in downtown Kansas City, Kansas. Thank you, Dr. Bozier. Commission, any questions? Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Sister. Hey, um, just in clarity, are you all, have you all reached your fundraising goal? We have reached the fundraising goal that allows us to uh, move to construction. Um, we have a partner agreement with all three partners that they are financially obligated for anything that is not fundraised. So in essence, we are at 100%, but we are uh, going to continue to fundraise to try and get as close to 100% uh, raised with the fundraising efforts as possible. Okay, well, well, congratulations and kudos to you and, and your board and your staff for getting that done. I have another really miscellaneous question for staff. Is there a reason why we're selling it for $10? This, Commissioner, this is proposed as an in-kind um, donation to the college to assist their efforts. Um, that's what's being proposed. Um, obviously, it is the commission's discretion, um, but that, that's the proposal. Okay, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that's, that's fine. I, I didn't know if there's any rhyme or reason behind it, but I'm in full support. I'm, I'm excited to see this transition and the revitalization of downtown. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mr. Haley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Dr. Moser, I too, as you know, I'm ex extremely excited about the overall project. Glad to hear that. Um, you've reached the funding point that you anticipated and to see it move forward. Certainly glad you got over the uh, hurdle of the historic uh, property that's there and how that's going to be met. Uh, so succinctly, and I wish we had a map um, or some sort of a, you know, so that I could visualize. I'm familiar with the area, but is this going to be, uh, um, if approved, basically parking or you said there was something, a residential component, and I'm trying to see how it, if approved, is going to meet with the existing uh, facility. You mentioned or referenced uh, the kitchen there, the food kitchen. Is that independent of that? I, again, I wish I had a uh, some sort of a map to point to because I sure, heard I, the addresses, but I don't know exactly how they meet with what's already there. Sure, I apologize for that. No. Um, so the the ground that is being identified is currently parking lot. Um, the, the entrance to the college facility will be on the corner of uh, 7th Street and State Avenue. 600 State Avenue is the far southeast corner. Um, there is a blue building standing there Currently, it's been a variety of different denominational churches, and, and the last service was as a Hispanic um, uh, store that just sold general items uh, to the community. This is to the east side of that, so it's the very bottom right-hand corner, southeast corner of the block on 6th and State Avenue. The, the top half of that block 
Willa Gill Center is in the just about in the center, slightly west. There is a dirt gravel parking lot from the, the east side of Willa Gill over to Sixth Street. And that is the other piece of property that is being identified as 645 Nebraska. Uh, the Willa Gill will stay as it is for now uh, until solutions are, are made available for maybe a, a, a full service encompassing um, food service, um, housing, additional services provided to the community. Um, and then there's a parking lot to the west of that as well. So that will still stay intact. We're just talking about the gravel lot that is on the east side of Willa Gill to 6th Street, and then the bottom southeast corner of that block on 6th and State Avenue. Let me ask you to speculate, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, Dr. Mosh, um, what the future, once you're up and running, might be of the location of, you know, food kitchen and what is then the heart or very close to the heart of uh, your facility. I don't know the mechanics of what's happening or what's envisioned, but would you anticipate if you could prophetically look at some point in time that the functions now met by the Willett Gill Center might be relocated? Might, uh, <clears throat> might just, Dr. Mosher, uh, Mr. Haley, there, there are some discussions around the provision of services that currently exist downtown and how those, you know, what the future could look like for those. So there are some active discussions. The mayor has his task force on the homeless and, um, and, and so there are sort of several conversations that are, you know, overlapping at this point. Uh, so we do anticipate here in the next, I don't know, several months, year or so to have some sort of ideas to put back on the table in terms of what that could look like in the future. Uh, but um, I don't have anything concrete at this point for consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howells. And, and we, have, uh, uh, we have no desire to disrupt the services that are currently provided there. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. All right. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Mosher. I just I think about what fits. You know, you have the academic environment, you have students coming and going, and then you have those that are underhoused or, um, in fact, need of the social service of, of UDA. And I don't know for the full flow and the mix of what's happening in the transformation, if it, if it is a seamless mix that they're there uh, or disruption of service may or may not be in the best interest of um, the success of the long range of the long range project. Um, if I could remember exactly what I said, I would. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Make sure we get you on. Just uh, let, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, just looking to the future of what the mix might be with the existing the uh, land use and the, um, the functions that are provided in the future of what's anticipated with this much appreciated project of the school. I don't know how long range the two might successfully coexist. Sure. And so anyway, it's a philosophical uh, musing on my part. And pardon me, uh, Mr. Chair, for going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> on the microphone, nonetheless. Thank you, Dr. Mosier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner McKiernan. Thank you, Chair. So this actually, the map is actually in our agenda packet as an appendix, but for those people who don't have it, I just pulled up dot maps and cobbled together this little diagram. And I do believe that the areas that I've shaded in green are the areas that we're contemplating with this. And I would remind everybody that these are the same areas that we previously committed to the Lanier Group project um, way back when. So it's not new that we are considering the transfer of these properties for another use because we previously contemplated that. But Mr. Waters, am I fairly accurate in terms of what we're looking at? Yes, absolutely. Perfect, thank you so much. Thank you, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, I'll ask the clerk if there were any comments received from the public. No comments received. 
I'll ask, uh, I'll now recognize members of the public who wish to address the committee. I'll ask the clerk if there are any hands raised by the public who wish to speak. No hands raised. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak? You will be given up to three minutes to make your comments. Please come to the podium and state your name and city of residence for the record. And I believe Madam Clerk will give you the timeline with uh, one minute remaining. Please make sure your microphone is on. Green, there we go. Thank you. My name is Stephen Smith, uh, Lake Quivera. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, tonight about this real estate purchase. I'm on the board of Hot Lunch Service Inc. Uh, more commonly known as the St. Mary's Food Kitchen. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we've been serving a, a free hot lunch, a free lunch, seven days a week, 365 days a year for the past 41 years, and have operated out of the 645 Nebraska building that's subject to this transaction since the 1997. We've not missed a single day during that entire 41 years of serving the people Kansas City, Kansas. And that includes working through all the issues that we faced during the pandemic. Uh, just for a sense of volume, to, in 2022, we served 80, 81,000 meals. We are projecting to exceed 91,000 this year, just to give you a sense of scale. Now, with regard to this transaction to date, we've really received very limited information, have not been included in any, really in any discussions for a couple of years at least. Um, in fact, we just heard about this meeting by chance. So we have a few questions we'd like to pose and, and a request, okay? As I understand, per the resolution, the real estate to be purchased by the community college includes a portion of this subject 645 property that we're one of the tenants. And, and we're just looking for some clarity with regard to how or if this impacts our operation. It's not clear. You look at the exhibits and what you put up earlier, um, Mr. McKernan helped because the exhibits attached to the resolution, you could not tell what, what part of the property for 645 was, was subject to this purchase. So that was helpful to see. But- um, One minute remaining. So first of all, if the building remains as is, we have access questions in terms of how we access the building. Will that change? Do we have access to the alley? Uh, how our volunteers can park um, and where they park? It looks like the parking lot will, will stay. Uh, do our clients, will they have continued safe access every day while we feed them during this construction period? Um, and then there's a whole host of questions if in fact we are asked to move our operation at some future point that was that was referenced here tonight, um, and how the UG will work with us on that. So, the the main thing from our standpoint, we need to understand for our planning purposes the proposed timeline for all this to happen, what's going to happen, and that we get included in all future communications relative to this project. So that's our request that. Uh, we continue to work with the Time has UG expired. on this and that we are notified. We're happy to provide you contact information. So um, thank you very much. Please, next person to speak. Green. Is it green? There you go. Hello. Jacqueline Albert of Loom Park. Is that okay? Okay, in continuation of what he was saying, the one additional um, issue that we would like to bring up, within that building, there is Mount Carmel, and there is Hot Lunch Servicing doing business as St. Mary's Food Kitchen. Two separate entities. The information that goes to Mount Carmel goes to Mount Carmel. It does not come to us. We have not been in the loop because of the fact that somewhere along the line, it was believed that we were employees or managed by or um, in some way part of Mount Carmel. We are not. 
We are a 501c3, a non-for-profit that take care of the homeless and the food insecure. We are there for the marginalized. We are not in any way related to Mount Carmel. Why is this important? It is important because we're not getting the information. We're not in the loop. And that's all we're asking. Please talk to us. Please include us. We want to continue for another 41 years. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to speak? Let the record show no one else has stepped forward. Thank you, committee. Commissioner Stites. Stites, District 7, I think it's totally ridiculous that we've got this far down the road in this project and somebody that's doing this kind of great work in our community has no idea what's going on, hasn't been involved. I don't know where the breakdown or the failure has occurred there, but I think it's terrible. And I thank you guys for what you're doing in our community. Um, I, I, I have other questions regarding this location, the funding, the tax implications to our um, constituents. We're, we're already, we already have a community college. Anyway, I'll get into those questions later, but I just can't believe that we are this far down the road and these folks are being treated this way. It's terrible. Mr. Haley. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. So you, uh, from the last two speakers, so who who does who's who owns Willie Gill? Does the city own the city owns Willie Gill, and so we lease the city leases to the two. Is it a leased agreement with them right now? That would be yes. Okay, <clears throat> there are two separate contracts: one with Mount Carmel, one with Hot Lunch. How often are those renewed? Uh, they were renewed last year, I believe. Are they annual? So they're annual contracts? Uh, I don't know if they renewed annually, but they were renewed last year. Okay. Has there been a variance to your uh, knowledge previously in terms of use or, or what the contract has been for the lessees for those two that, that were here today? Has there been any variance in uh, what the facility can provide or surrounding area? Uh, variance in terms of from the well, you know, maybe parking or you know, what's allowed. I'm sure there's some code matters, you know, and uh, that might be there. I mean, have there been any, any new provisions or differing provisions in the in several years at least that the city has leased um, to these two? So this would be the first change in the surrounding use of the building for the two tenants. That they have if approved yes and yes i think that if i'm understanding your question correctly yeah the, they've been operating in the kind of the same you know physical environment uh and so this this would be the first time that, that has the physical environment is checked so here's what i'm getting at so there there are two tenants that are in a city owned and operated building that has been leased to them for a number of years correct yes okay and during that particular time, there's been no variance in what their responsibility has been, which I will make the assumption that they've met, um, or new requirements by the city of change in the peaceable use and enjoyment for that which they've contracted to use the, the, the premises for. I say, not that I'm aware of. Right, again, to the best of your knowledge. That's my knowledge. Uh, but. All right. So, this would be a, cha a change in what they have known, if approved, for quite some time, but for very, well, arguably, for a, a broader use of the surrounding area. Uh, yes, comma. If you look at the map, the I think the portion of the property that's you know because the the plat is envisioned to be subdivided, so the portion of the plat that is currently being utilized for the service delivery. Is is the same as it's kind of held harmless in a sense. The portion to the east is the portion that is uh, uh, to be given to the community college for their project. 
So and okay. I'll ask Mr. Waters if he has. Right. This had contemplated to be an athletic field for some time under the linear development. And now it, it's contemplated to be a parking lot. So, I mean, the the reuse of this as, as a different in a different way had been contemplated for some time. Um, but instead of a, a grass field, it sounds like now it, it would be a, a parking lot. So that's the only the difference. I need to think this through further, but thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for now. I appreciate the responses. Thank you. There, there was a lady had her hand up in the back. I want to make sure if you have a response, public comment is closed unless somebody wants to make a motion to allow you to speak again. Towns and second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. You will have up to three minutes. Please restate your name and place of residence, please. Jacqueline Elbert, Overland Park. The reason I said wait is because there has been a change. We, that building was built for us. It, it was a social concerns group, along with Bob Dole, that built that building for the usage to serve the people food, okay? We had been in there with a lease up until most recently where they changed it to a license. We are only licensed to utilize the space, which means we can't even lock our supply closet door where our, our things are because it's not our building. We don't even get to lock our office where our financial information is because they have given us a license, not a lease. We're not tenants. We are somebody who gets to come in there every day, serve food, and leave. Now, is that what that building was meant for? No, that was not what it was built for. It was for us to come in there and to provide a service and have a space that we could operate within. And this license expires at the end of this year. Then what? It took us two years to get to this point to get a license instead of a lease. It's frustrating. We are here to do something good for the community and we're getting treated so badly. I'm not saying, oh, poor, poor, pitiful us. I'm saying, look at why we are here. Look at why this building was built. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to remind the committee that we're not here to debate Willa Gill. We're here to debate the uh, project, the resolution for the Kansas City, Kansas Community College. But I do appreciate the comments that have been made. And I do want to show respect to those in the audience who feel so passionate about this item. So uh, uh, commissioners, any other comments or concerns? Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the comments raised by uh, Mr. Smith and Ms. Elbert um, and commissioners' uh, depiction there, I just want to make sure I understand. The area showed in green um, that borders closer to the north that showed Nebraska Avenue. Is that totally vacant property or not? That's totally vacant property now. Okay. So... To Ms. Elbert's concerns, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. When Ms. Elbert, Mr. Smith, you talk about the building, do you currently co-occupy the Willa Smith, uh, Willa Gill Center, correct? Okay. And, and I agree with you. You should know as an independent occupant of that building what's going on as well. But currently, you're not using the green space for delivery of any service. Okay. All right. Um, the segment to the south, that green space, which is also at issue here, is that totally vacant property now? Okay. Yes. All right, thank you. Any other comments, Commissioner Davis? Thank you, Commissioner Davis, District Day. This is news to me um, regarding 
kind of um, the, the concerns and, and I do hear you all um, as far as wanting to be considered. I would leave that up to staff and, and the community college just to get folks up to speed and perhaps um, even if it's not this standing committee, maybe at another standing committee, there would be a discussion about that particular situation. Um, I don't, for me, it doesn't necessarily change whether or not we sell this for $10. I think that's another conversation on the relationship between the UG and the folks that are VCs, or if you have a license, or if you're using that particular space. Um, but I, I do hear the unfairness of not being considered um, throughout, which is which is unfortunate. I don't know what the reasoning is, but I um, do want to validate those particular feelings. Um, I, with that, I'm still in favor of this particular transition committee so that we can keep going with this particular project and have that conversation about Willa Gill at another time. Um, but yes, I do hear um, those concerns, and I hope at another time we can have that discussion. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging me again. Um, initially, I had concerns about which side uh, of the Willa Gill we were talking about. So thanks again, Commissioner McKernan, for your depiction. So, depiction. so to the west of the Willa Gill segment, I noticed that parking takes place there for uh, recipients of the services of Willa Gill. So we are not talking about that. So I'm, I'm of the opinion right now, please correct me if I'm wrong, if uh, Mr. Chair will allow um, either Mr. Smith or Ms. Ms. Elbert to address this. There is no parking again currently being used in the green space to the north by your Okay, all right. But parking is still being used, uh, at least for the time being, to the west of what's depicted there as the Willow Gill Center. So that was a concern I have. Again, I do agree that as a tenant um, there of the Willow Gill Center, it would, it would be appropriate to know what's going on. But as has been mentioned before, the Lanier Project contemplated years ago that green space as a field. The use has changed now, um, but I'm not understanding that this would interfere with the delivery of your services. The alley, is that the space between the end of the green field and Willa, Willa Gill? Okay. Dr. Moser, yes. you have something to add. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Townsend, were you done with your question? Well, that, that would be a concern for delivery of, of um, uh, St. Mary's to continue to provide any service. And how might that be addressed if the sale went forward? Is that a right of way that's still in the city's control or how does that work? Chair Member, if, if I may, and I also want to provide some clarity to um, some of the feedback that has been provided. Uh, KCKCC and the Unified Government, Mount Carmel, representatives from St. Mary's and Wyandotte Behavioral Health Network, who also operates the Frank Williams Center on the other side of the street, has sat down in conversation. All entities mentioned have sat down in conversations um, during the past couple of years. I also have some more meetings scheduled uh, on this topic with uh, Mount Carmel. I will make sure that St. Mary's is also on that list because I do have their um, contact information from when we met prior. When we have sat down and talked, we talked about that alleyway. That is the place where they have their loading dock that they receive their food. So the college has made a commitment that during the construction process of the new building, which is a $60 million investment in downtown Kansas City, Kansas, which is economic development and for the good of the community, 
that we will not block their access to this loading dock uh, and that we will not do anything that will disrupt services to the people that receive the important services and, and receive food from that location. So um, the items that have been brought up tonight have been discussed and are in conversation and um, the college and the unified government and the mayor's office, we've all been talking about these things. So it's, it's not brand new. Thank you, Dr. Moser. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you. Would it be appropriate based on Dr. Mosher's comments, counselor, to somehow document that as part of this sale or at what time or in what uh, paperwork? Because if you're dealing with real estate, it doesn't exist if it's not in writing. So, and, and I'm encouraged to hear that you've been speaking with, with uh, these different services, including St. Mary's about not blocking access then? I could certainly add a provision in there to clarify that. I think also that would probably come through their building permits. Uh, I imagine that when they're doing that, there would be stipulations put on. Um, so I think there's multiple checkpoints where we could do that, but I'd be happy to do that. So could that be part of what's done tonight with regard to the sale? I, I could add that um, if it advances to full commission, I could put that language in there prior to full commission. And if I may, there'll be a point where we are working in that area, but we'll be very cognizant of making sure that, you know, the, everyone, the food is able to be delivered, et cetera. So that is high on our priority list. Thank you. And if I may, I just want to remind the committee that this is item number four and it is the, a resolution authorizing the unified government to enter into two real estate purchase agreements with the Kansas City, Kansas Community College. Okay. Seeing no other comments, I would, it's an action, actionable item. I'd entertain a motion. Commissioner Townsend. Um, I would move to approve the resolution uh, as proposed with the addition uh, of language that would uh, make it clear that St. Mary's would continue despite the sale to have access through that alley. So their delivery of services could continue. Is that just during construction, I think is what I heard. Well, at any time, that's the intent. Yeah, that would be correct, yes. yes. At any time, because the sale will transfer the title, but at no time, if I'm understanding Dr. Mosher's position, uh, would there be blockage of the alley so St. Mary's could continue um, their delivery uh, of services? I want to make sure I, you want to second it? I was, Commissioner, can you restate that yes, one more time? Thank you. <laughs> I move to adopt the resolution with the addition of language that would document um, that access to the alley between, I guess that would be the Western part of the Willow Gill Center um, and the property that we are to sell to um, the college would not be blocked at any time um, and that they would have perpetual uh, and continuous access uh, to that alley. May, I'm sorry, this may not be appropriate, but, but there may be some inter intermittent times but we will make all accommodations to get the food to the site because they're going to have to work on that alley at some point in time so i can't say it would absolutely never be blocked that wouldn't be false but we would be making the appropriate accommodations to ensure that the Willa Gill Center, Mount Carmel, St. Mary's is able to receive their food shipments and provide their services to their uh, constituents. 
So if, if I may, I guess, uh, Commissioner Townsend, maybe um, unobstructed delivery of continued unencumbered access to the delivery access point of Willa Gill during construction uh, time. Uh, I, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I, I want you, it was getting quite lengthy there. <laughs> and I think it can be a succinct thing. I'm just trying to find an avenue. I understand, I think there's a perception as to what you want to do. And, and that's what I was really going for as opposed to trying to exactly wordsmith it right now. Council was um, nodding his head. So um, I think I can draft some language and you can look at it. Um, and if you have suggestions, you know, feel, please tell me, but I, I think I can come up with something based on um, the language you, you gave in the motion. Thank you. Commissioner Davis. I, mean, I will second that. That is the intent. So <laughs> yeah, what, that's the intent. I, I understand the spirit of what we're trying to do. So yes, I second that. Okay, thank you. Committee, we have a motion and a second. I'd ask clerk, please call roll. Roll call, Haley. Aye. Davis. Aye. Townsend. Aye. Seitz. McKiernan. Aye. Burroughs. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Thank you, Dr. Moser. Thank you. Public, thank you for your comments this evening and your patience with us. Yeah. Commissioner Stites. This item's already closed. I would like for us to explore the options of what we may be able to do with getting them out of just an occupancy um, status into uh, some sort of a long-term lease so that their future is certain and that it, the rug can't be jerked out from under them at any time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Item number five, our last action item for the evening is a resolution authorizing the execution of a second supplemental indenture with regard to the taxable industrial revenue bonds for the Dairy Farmers of America Incorporated project building submitted by Patrick Waters, Chief Counsel, and I'll recognize Patrick Waters at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am going to turn it over to uh, Bond Counsel, Kevin Wempe, to uh, discuss this item. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Kevin Wempe with Gilmore and Bell, the Unified Government's Bond Counsel. Uh, before I give a brief overview, I just want to state that Dairy Farmers of America, the beneficiary of this industrial revenue bond, uh, has a representative here, Mr. Steve Sparks, should there be any questions that should be directed. Um, so there's a resolution in front of you to be a, uh, approve a second supplemental indenture for these IRBs. Um, I'll, it does two things. And number one is it extends the term of the bond documents through the abatement period of 2027, which was, had been contemplated all along. And second, it installs um, a backup index of secured overnight financing rate or SOFR, which replaces the, the benchmark, the interest rate on the bonds that was originally LIBOR, the London Interbank Offering Rate. Um, a little bit of background about why those two things are necessary, and I'll, I'll, I'll be concise here, but uh, if you'll recall in 2017, these bonds were issued near con uh, completion of construction, and that commenced the 10-year pilot property tax pilot, again, not the utility pilot, as mentioned earlier tonight. Um, unlike most of the IRBs in, in the unified government, this was not a buy-your-own bond where the company was purchasing its own bond and instead was a real financing where Wells Fargo purchased this IRB. And uh, um, in alignment with their, their credit um, restrictions, they only extended for five years on their loan for uh, these bonds in the facility. And again, the, the benchmark for the interest rate was LIBOR at the time. Um, so again, with the five-year term, initially, we always contemplated supplements. And if you'll recall, in 2021, uh, the unified government approved the first supplement to those IRB documents and, again, extended five years, which unfortunately brought us one year short of the full 10-year term of the abatement, which is part of the reason we're here again tonight. And it also, at that time, installed a backup interest rate index, because uh, if you remember a couple of years ago, that's when uh, LIBOR was beginning to, um, the end date for that index um, was targeted. And now, in fact, uh, we know LIBOR is ending here in the next couple of months. And so that brings us to tonight, for the second supplemental indenture to again clarify the benchmark benchmark interest rate index of SOFR, uh, extend the bond documents through 2027 in the full abatement term. And it should be noted that 
the payment in lieu of taxes were agreed to uh, at issuance of 2017, those remain. So the business deal and property taxes coming through to the unified government remain unchanged with this supplement. So with that overview, happy to answer any questions you might have. If I may, just a point of clarity, Council. The you said the abatement will end in 2027, or is it going to go beyond 2027? No, that that's the final year in Kansas. We get a maximum of 10 years, and so with the abatement commencing in 2018, 2027 will be the final year of property tax abatement. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I understood correctly because I do know that it's a 10 year limit and I just wanted to ensure that we weren't exceeding the 10 year limit. Here. Okay, thank you. Questions committee? Seeing none, okay. Uh, are there any uh, questions from the public? No comments received. Thank you. Now I'll recognize members of the public who wish to address the committee. Is there any hands raised? No hands raised. Okay. Uh, any in the audience who wishes to speak on this issue? Let the record show no one step forward. Committee, this is an actionable item. I entertain a motion. Here in District 2, move to approve as submitted. Davis, second. Thank you. We have, committee, we have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Bites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, committee. That takes us to our last item of the evening, which is not an action item. It's an information only item, and I will wait till staff has a chance to get seated and, and uh, comfortable with where they are, and then we'll, we'll step into the fourth quarter 2022 budget to actuals report, something I know all of you are uh, ready to hear this evening. So, so, so I do know that we have Reginald Lindsay, Budget Director, and Deborah Johnson, Interim CFO. Ladies and gentlemen, at your convenience. Thank you, Commissioners. Good evening. Um, we are here to uh, re uh, report on the uh, fourth quarter uh, budget to actuals for the fiscal year ending 2022. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with the report and talk about the revenues, and then I'll turn it over to Reginald Lindsay, our uh, budget director, uh, to talk about the expenses. So we'll start out with the consolidated general fund. Um, as you know, this consists of the city, county, and parks general funds. Um, this first slide is just a uh, comparison of fiscal year 2021. So as you can see, um, revenues collected um, for 2022 were 102.2% of uh, budget. Expenditures were 93.7%. Um, well, I guess I'll, I'll go back to the revenues. 102.2% 100, of, of the budget um, compared with 99.5% that was collected in 2021. On the expenditures, 93.7% was collected in 2022 compared with 96% um, in 2021. The net allocations and transfers, that's your transfers in and transfers out, those get netted together. Um, so that's why the percentages are a little, um, they're, they're, they, they're not a true representation because the, the transfers in are netted against the transfers out. So, um, but did wanna highlight in 2022, You'll notice that that number is 11 million, 11.2 million. Um, I am going to cover a little bit of what the, some of those transfers were on the next slide um, because that number was so large. Um, we wanted to kind of point out what, what we had going on there. So, and did also want to note too on 2022, um, the ending uh, balance year to date uh, should be 46.4 million. Um, I think we might have had a um, need to take a look at um, that beginning uh, start of year for 2022. I think that we may have had an incorrect formula there. So going on to the next slide, and this is the um, capital projects and uh, operating uh, transfers that were done in 2022. We want to note, um, I won't go over each individual project. I'll just note that each of these projects were budgeted in 2022. Um, most of these projects um, were in some form of progress, progression, and so to continue, they didn't, they may not have had funding in 2023, so to, to continue that project moving forward, we've transferred those funds to a capital project 
The total is 10.3 million. Um, did want to just point out the first two items on the list are the ARPA funds, the revenue replacement funds, which is the majority of this money. It's about 7 million. Um, three and a half million was set aside for the grant match um, on ARPA. And then the other 3.3 million was the Kansas Avenue uh, bridge repair. So um, since we had those funds had been allocated, we wanted to ensure that we had those funds moving forward. So they were moved along with some of the other projects. Um, Reginald Lindsay is also, also going to cover some of those, um, these projects when he talks about the expenditures. So moving on to the next slide, we'll talk about the city general fund. Um, so just uh, note that um, we collect the revenue percent collected was 103.8%. The budget number was 160.9 million and we collected 167.1 million. Um, just a, maybe a couple of things to note, property tax was at 101.8%. 100, um, so that would indicate that, you know, we do build, when we set the budget, we build in a delinquency factor. Um, so um, that would indicate, because that number does not include any delinquent collections. So that would indicate that we collected maybe a little bit more than what we anticipated. Um, sales tax, <clears throat> excuse me, sales tax is um, at 105%. I uh, did just want to note there that um, for the current year, it was about 2.6 million over budget um, and total sales tax was about 4.5 million over the prior year. So we did, we did have an increase in sales tax there. Um, other taxes, <clears throat> which include the pilot, motor vehicle and other franchise taxes, as well as the casino uh, revenues, 106.4%. Um, and then we've got intergovernmental revenues at 100%, uh, charges for service at 100%. Um, permits and licenses were down. They're only about 84%. Um, I think that was about 250,000. And um, then on the fines and forfeitures, we were also down there. Um, and I believe that the amount, the largest amount there was the municipal court revenues, um, which are down about 350,000. The graph, um, the next graph on there is just a comparison also showing the, you know, we compare where the 100% line would be and where each of these categories compares with the prior year. Um, and this graph kind of um, just goes along with the percentages that were on the other graph. So this next one, last slide on the city general fund, um, just kind of showing the same information. This uh, is, uh, fourth quarter 2022 year to date actual compared with 2021 and just showing the increases or decreases um, total overall. Um, in 2021, we had 164.1 million. In 2022, 167.1 million for a total of 2.9 million. Um, probably the largest difference there is the intergovernmental revenues. Um, as you can see, ARPA um, funds are in this category in 2021. We had revenue replacement dollars of about 12.9 to the city general fund. And in 2022, it was only 3.6 million. So that was, that was the majority of that difference. Next, we'll go on to the county general fund. Um, for the county general fund, we collected a total of 99.1% of the revenues that were budgeted. We budgeted 76.6 million and we collected 75.9 million. Um, property tax, again, was 102.1%. Sales tax at 104.6. Uh, we'll just note that sales tax was 400000 over budget for the current year and about 650000 over the prior year actual. Um, and then charges for service, 106%. And um, let's see. Fines and forfeits are only at 76%. Um, I did notice that there, you know, some of the fees for the, the tech funds um, were down. Um, so I think that's accounting for some of that. Um, and then in miscellaneous, tra miscellaneous and transfers <clears throat> uh, has interest revenue, interest on delinquent tax, um, as well as some other fees. Um, the interest revenue was up about 600,000 um, for that. So just the same graph over here on the side um, just kind of shows where if we collected 100% of budget, um, where those lines would be. Um, they kind of 
uh, coordinate with the percentages uh, in the other graph. The final slide for the County General Fund, um, giving out all the, the information, comparing with 2020, 2021 fourth year, uh, fourth quarter year to date actuals. Um, said, let's see, property tax was about 1.7 million uh, over compared with uh, 2021. Um, probably the biggest uh, difference was the intergovernmental, which again is the ARPA revenues. For 2021 in the County General Fund, um, there were 6.1 million in revenue replacement funds. And in 2022, there were only 2.6 million. So that's, that's the biggest difference there. So we were actually down about 693,000 in revenue compared with uh, 2021. That concludes the revenue. So I'll turn this over to Reginald Lindsay, our budget director to talk about expenditures. Thank you, Debbie. So we're two, we have two different views here on screen now. We have uh, budget to actuals for 2022 at the top of the screen and at the bottom of the screen we have where we're comparing the budget expenditures for 2021 to 2022. So I'll start off with the top uh, chart where we have six categories that we're comparing for expenditures. Uh, we can see we spent 99% of the budget for 2022. Uh, our six categories are personnel, services, supplies, grants, claims, miscellaneous transfers out, and capital outlay. Um, some of the bigger departments within the city general fund are obviously with police and fire, but also we have public works, and then we also have transit and NRC that kind of round out the top five in the city general fund. As we look at personnel, we can see we were uh, right spot on as far as we spent 100% of that budget, uh, which includes salaries, our payouts, our overtime and pension costs. And then in services, we were about 94%. And um, just kind of give an example of some of the contracts paid from services. Our transit contracts are paid from there. Also our trash contract is paid from there. Uh, this will, 2022 will be the last year that that trash contract is paid from there. We started an enterprise fund for it in 2023. Uh, also, we have software maintenance that is paid from there at about $2.2 million. Uh, then we come down to grants and claims. We can see we're about 94% of our expenditures, and that's where we had some legal claims paid from. And then also, uh, next category, miscellaneous transfers out. This is an item that Debbie covered a little earlier where we were uh, transferring uh, projects and some costs from 2022's budget to 2023's budget. The amount of the city general fund was about $8.8 .8 .8 million. There were about 25 uh, items that were moved. Um, and some of this have related to when we had the cyber incident at, at the early part of 2022. And then also some of our projects, some vendors are being selective in um, accepting projects. So uh, we, we weren't able to get some of our projects priced out. So we had to move them to the next year. Uh, as we compare um, 2021 actuals to 2022 actuals for uh, the fourth quarter, we can see the personnel is um, it's up about 3% from the prior year. Um, and then services is down about 10%, which is about $3 million. One of the numbers that we had there last year that we don't have there this year is like we have $4.7 million in ARPA money for the health department that was in 2021 that's not, that was not in 2022. Uh, supplies were up 13%, grants and claims were up 24%, and miscellaneous transfers were up um, 239%. And that's the number I talked about where we transferred the $8.8 .8 million. And there's two big projects here that Debbie talked about earlier. Uh, one is the ARPA funding for grant matches and then also Central Avenue or Kansas Avenue Bridge for the repair on it that was there also which makes up $7 million. So next slide, uh, comparing the county general fund, um, top chart compares like the actuals for 2022 to the budget, and the bottom chart compares 2021's budget to 2022's budget, and, and it's the actual expenditures. So we can see uh, with the 2022 actuals, we spent almost 96% of the budget, some of the larger departments within the county general fund include sheriff, um, dispatch services, 
also our district attorney and also finance. <clears throat> and again, uh, looking at personnel, we see we spent 98% of the budget, bigger items there being spent out of there are salaries, pensions, payouts, benefits and overtime and services that we have over in the county general fund. Um, the larger ones uh, consist of items that are paid for sheriff's department, including inmate calls, jail calls, uh, jail insurance for, for inmates. And then also uh, we had supplies and supplies consist of like utilities, fuel and parts and maintenance, which we spent about 83% of that budget, uh, grants and claims, uh, we, we did um, spend about 16% more in that budget uh, over or going over the budget and then miscellaneous transfers out. Um, we did transfer about $1.1 million of projects and uh, budget items from 2022 to 2023. Um, and that's again related to just projects that um, we needed to move that we were in the middle of that were kind of related to getting a late start on because of the cyber incident and also just contractors uh, being choice in what they accept to work on these days. And then looking at the uh, county general fund, how we compare it to 2021 over the, into 2022, we can see in personnel, our spending was up 16%. Uh, services were up 12%. Uh, supplies, we ended up spending like 33% more than we did last year. And our miscellaneous transfers out, uh, we spent 21% more, and that's again because of the $1.1 million that we transferred from 2022 to 2023, and capital was up 27%. This current slide is a, a view of our 10 tax levy funds, which include the city general fund, the county general fund that I did go over, but it includes our other tax levy funds. And what we have on um, the left side of the page, we have revenues. And then on the right side of the, side of the page, we have expenditures. And we, uh, rule of thumb is at this point in time of the year where we've ended the year, what we're looking for is revenues to be at around 100%. So when we see most of our revenues are, are, are at, at around 100% or above 100%, we can see all the tax levy funds together brought in almost 102% of their revenues. And as we look over at the expenditures, we can see that um, we got about 97% of the money that was spent. So what we look for to have here is we don't want any funds uh, having more than 100% spent. So we definitely met that goal. We had a few funds that did not spend all their money. And one of the, some of those are aging and development disabilities. Um, the Most of the money left there had to do with having vacancies and personnel items that, that were not spent. And then also those funds, they do have reserves and the reserves did not need to be spent. And here's a view of our other funds outside our tax levy funds. So these include like our special sales tax funds and our enterprise funds. And uh, on the left side of the page, we do have the revenues. And on the right side of the page, we do have the expenditures. On the revenue side, a rule of thumb is that um, we, we definitely want to collect around 90% of, of the revenue or hundred percent of the revenue. And we can see where we do have some funds that did not collect um, the hundred percent of the revenue. So we have like clerk, clerk technology fund and court trustees and also um, treasury technology fund that did not, not collect a uh, hundred percent of their budget. Uh, we're a little below. And as we get over into the expenditures, we did have some funds um, the rule of thumb here is we want to spend 100% of the budget, or at least try to. Uh, and we do have some funds that did not spend 100% of the budget. Um, so some of those starting out is alcohol fund, and then also uh, clerk technology fund, and also court trustee, um, special asset fund, um, and then also uh, travel and tourism fund. We did not spend all the money there. Uh, and that kind of is the presentation that Debbie and I had. Are there any questions? Committee questions? Seeing, seeing none. Reggie, I do have a question. It, um, it, on this chart that you show here, we're 16% below our expenses uh, of what was uh, 
versus our revenue stream, correct? Is that what? So, so that is uh, what we set aside in the budget for those. We came below 16% below the budget, not the revenue stream, but 16% below, below the expenditure budget. Okay. It's, it's, next, next question. I'm glad to see that these, I want to go back a page or two. It looks like the funds are evened out after we went through and readjusted the mill levies a couple of years back on the individual, well, I think it's nine or 11 funds that we had uh, right there. I, that, that fund, those funds have pretty much leveled out compared to what they've been in the past because they've had a tremendous amount. They've jumped around over the years. But uh, we, looks like overall the revenue projections uh, exceeded all projections in most cases. And you guys have, somebody has controlled the uh, expenditures well, but the ARPA funding kind of skews this. We're going to get away from that soon. And well, I think it'll paint a more solid picture for us because when you exclude and include the uh, ARPA funding in here, it kind of skews the bottom numbers. Right. We had the ARPA revenue replacement was in, um, 2021 and 2022. There is nothing budgeted for revenue replacement in 2023. So we shouldn't see that going forward. Great. Thank you. I, I sincerely appreciate it. Committee, any other questions? Chairman, if I, if I might have just on that too, uh, there were some other one time kind of bumps on the revenue side that might be worth um, bringing to the committee's attention. Uh, so, like the Casey Current played their season. In the in the Sporting KC Stadium this past year, that increased to a million point two million dollars. So when they show up in their new stadium uh, on the riverfront, that one point two million dollars isn't going to go away. So there are a couple of those that are kind of transitory in a sense. That as we think about what our future revenue picture looks like, um, that we just kind of keep those in mind. I don't know if there's some others. So in the city in the city general fund, there was about seven more seven million dollars more in revenue that came in. Uh, some of their revenue did include like around possibly $4 million in ARPA. Uh, so there's just some we, that would not be in the budget next year. And then also sales tax was up $3 million. Pilot revenue was up about $1.5 million. And those are some things that we can look at. Because, um, I mean, there is a possibility that those will roll into our next budget. And then property taxes, Debbie said, was up 400000 So So revenues were $7 million above, but we do have some expenses that won't show up, as Alan said, in the next budget. Or, or, rep, or revenues that will not show up in the next budget. The stadium parking was one that we were having to supplement. I believe that contract has been remedied and we are now being the stadium parking situation. We were having to supplement that, if I remember correctly, because it, it wasn't performing the way it should. So I'm sure that revenue that when it talks about uh, the uh, additional revenue coming in, that's because of its cost avoidance, if I remember correctly. Uh, add, uh, Alan, you might go back and look at that. I, I think that's an accurate statement. We we did increase the uh, ticket tax. Yes. Um, for the for the the stadium out there, um, and that is the, yeah, that was to cover the debt that we'd issued on the parking. And I think we're, we're kind of reviewing that every year, but I think in addition to that, we did, we did collect the additional funds for, um, at the soccer for the women's soccer, um, games that were played out at sporting. Well, that helps us retire that debt. And, uh, but I know that's not an expense we're having to spend moving forward. That's that cost avoidance I was talking about. The next one I wanted to talk about, um, was the, um, uh, I'm sorry, I was, Debbie, I was listening to you and it just left me. Uh, so, uh, oh, the, the uh, emergency response for the, uh, uh, I want to call it, I, I had it marked here. Bear with me just one second. Um, I'll, have to, I'll, I'll find it and then I'll come back and, and talk to you all about us specifically, but I know that we were supplementing that program for a, a, about a million dollars a year. Are you talking about the e, our EMS fund? Yes, thank you. That's exactly what it was. And if, uh, I don't know what action we're going to take on that committee, but uh, we, we may need to be mindful that foregoing fees and penalties during a COVID time impacts our revenue stream. 
However, it helps our constituents. But moving forward, be mindful that anytime we forgive a fee or revenue stream, we're actually cutting our budget. We're appropriating dollars through a different process. So with that, any other questions, any other comments? Mr. Haley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the review. This is most interesting to see how it breaks out. You referenced there's going to be a shift um, for the trash collection. Uh, you know, as that's one of the line items that the BPU um, um, collects. And what is that again? You're saying that there'll be another. We started a, what we call an enterprise fund for it. It used to be paid out of our city general fund. So we created an enterprise for it, fund for it. And so that cost will be moved out of our city general fund and about $9 million won't show up in our city general fund anymore on the revenue side and the expenditure side and it'd be moved to this new enterprise fund that we have. The collection will be the same. Yes. Something that's billed through, um, through our utility bill. Right, we're, we're st yeah, st we're st we'll still be collecting the fee um, and paying the, paying the vendor, but we, we've simply just moved it out of the general fund and, and put it into a separate enterprise fund by itself so that we can, we can, you know, we can track all of the expenses related to the revenues that we're collecting. It'll still be the same line item amount, though, roughly. There won't be any um, decrease in the amount billed. Perhaps it's still going to be roughly the same. Well, we're, you mean for the, for the next year, for the coming year? Yes. Um, no, while well, we're still reviewing that, um, we will probably, as we get into the budget, um, we'll determine if, we, if there has to be any increase there. Uh, let me ask, um, it was an article recently just on that line. Um, this isn't, isn't the time. They were talking about the recycling and what exactly that went. I didn't know if, if we recoup or we recoup what will be for that fund through recycling that comes back in. You may not have that information available. Um, but I'm just kind of The contract with waste management includes both trash collection and recycling. So there, it's, it's billed as one amount together. It's, it's all part of the same contract. All right. Thank you. And also for information purposes, the enterprise fund that we started and all our enterprise funds, the ideal of them is they're, they're self-supporting for the revenues that come in, take care of the expenditures also. Okay. Thank you both, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Debbie, Reggie, thank you so very much. And it was important that we have that fourth quarter. It was getting a little late to forego until next month. And we made the decision to go ahead and have it this evening. So thank you for your patience with us this evening. And there's, this was not an actionable item. It was for information only. So that, that takes us to the end of our agenda. The next motion I would like to uh, get, have the committee make is a motion to adjourn so that we can go into our next meeting. Davis moves to adjourn. There's been a motion and a second. I would ask the clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Thank you, Mr. committee. Carries. All right. Well, we're, huh? am I on? I don't know that I'm on. <clears throat> I think I'm uh, running out of juice here. Our next committee will uh, let's take a 10 minute uh, because we do need to transition legal counsel. We need to bring Commissioner Bynum up to the table and we need to give the members of the committee a chance to take a break before we thoughtfully consider all the items on the neighborhood and community development agenda. So we will take 10 and I thank everyone who is here in the room with us for your patience as we have transitioned now. Before I call the meeting of the Neighborhood and Community Development Standing Committee to order, I want to again announce that due to COVID-19, some committee members, staff, and public are attending remotely via Zoom, in addition to those of us who are here on site. We ask that any participants joining us by phone or by Zoom, please mute your devices when not speaking so that we can avoid background noise here in the room. For everybody during the meeting, please make sure you announce yourself by name and title every time you speak so that the public that is observing knows who is speaking 
And this is critical given the number of remote participants in most of our meetings and his current guidance from the Kansas Attorney General. The public is allowed to submit comments for consideration by this committee prior to the meeting. The public is also allowed to participate participate via Zoom and or join us here in the fifth floor conference room to uh, give their comments. With all of that said, we'd like to welcome everyone to this meeting of the Neighborhood and Community Development Standing Committee. I'd ask the clerk to call roll, please. Roll call. Bynum? Here. Heights? Here. Davis? Here. Townsend? Here. Burroughs? Here. McKiernan? Here. We have three different uh, master items here on our agenda tonight. The first one is the biggest one that is, I'm sorry, I totally skipped over. Oh, that's right. That's why I skipped it. We don't have any, any minutes to approve. <laughs> I can guess in myself after I get started. So that does take us directly to the committee agenda. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Judd Knapp, who is our land bank manager to guide us through the land bank option applications in item number one. Thank you, Commissioner. So for tonight, uh, I think we could go through A1 through A9 without stopping, but if you have any questions, just let, let, let me know. And then A10 through 12 has a few problems or a few issues. Uh, and then we go to A13, A14 and 15 are the same property. So first one, A1, is at 2916 North 26th Street. Uh, the applicant actually lives just to the north on the adjoining property at 2918. Uh, they want to build a home there for their daughter and her family so they can live close to each other. Uh, staff didn't have any, any comments with this one. Um, it, it, meets, it meets zoning, so good to go. So that takes us to A2 and that's 3240 North 46th Street. Um, this is another, um, he is a builder and he wants to build his own house and he, he always wanted to uh, design and build his own home. And uh, staff didn't have any questions with this one and it is owned correctly. A3 is at 4907 Lathrop Avenue. This is with uh, JBOC LLC. This is a proven land bank uh, contractor. They've done several rehabs for us in the past. Uh, and they want to get into building homes, uh, but their lender wants them to build one first before they get more. Uh, so this is kind of like their test to see if, if it will work. So if this one works, they're going to come back with more. And they plan to rent this one or sell it the, depending on the market. Um, the pitcher uh, doesn't have a garage. Since this is our one single family, uh, I have told the applicant that. And they are getting plans that have a garage now. All right, A4 is at 3306 North 33rd Street. Um, this, they want to build a home that they could live in. Uh, this is not the first time we've seen this one. It's actually the third time we've seen this lot. Uh, we've had, the last one was a failed option that just didn't work out. Uh, but from our last conversation, uh, this property is 733 feet away from the Quindaro Bruin site. So I just wanna, it's, outside of any historical in environment. That's that. And then A5 is at 3032 North 33rd Street. Um, this is, um, they want to build a home that they could live in. Um, staff and, and and Sony didn't have a problem with this one either. A6 is a 1116 Washington Boulevard. Uh, they are, the person that's building this is a framer and uh, they're trying to build their own homes. They, they build homes for other people. So they're trying to uh, build one here. Uh, the same plan here is the same one that we'll see in A15 or RA in engineering. It's the same exact plan. Uh, we did get a comment from the Land Bank Advisory Board on this one. It says, could we hold this application until the neighbors have been notified? Um, I, this is in the Struggler Hills neighborhood. Uh, I emailed 
to Strugglers Hill, and I did get a response from them that said that they received what I sent them. Uh, and I also sent an, an email to uh, Groundworks because uh, it's in, in, in their area. A7 is um, they want to build a home to live in. This one's on 930 Central Avenue. It's for a smaller home. That's It's only like 600 square feet. So that would require a variance through planning and that would require another public meeting. But it does meet zoning for R1B. A8 is 3040 North 27th Street. Uh, this applicant doesn't want to live in this one, but he wants to rebuild his community by building homes. So he grew up here, and so he wants to give back by building homes that uh, will help his, his community. Uh, during the staff review, it had no issues. A9 is at 257 South Mill Street. I believe we saw this one last month or the month before that. Um, the applicant initially came forward with a garage, but it was denied. So now he's coming back and says, I want to build a home there. Uh, he does own 263, the adjoining lot that's just to the south of it. Uh, the picture there is actually the front of his house that he currently has, and he wants to make the house look like that on the front so it matches the neighborhood. But since there's like a great change in this house, the back of the house, he kind of wants like the garage under it with like a deck and a patio to uh, deal deal with that L elevation change. Um, been working with Public Works on this one. There is some storm water issues. Uh, there's some runoff from this parking lot that's coming down the alley. Um, Public Works is aware of it. Uh, the applicant is also aware of it. Uh, so I just make sure that they know that there could be some storm water issues with this parcel. A10 is where we get in a little bit different ones. This, this is for three parcels to build one home. Um, these, this land on Ruby is very steep, very hilly, but there is a house down here that's built on that hill. So it is possible, but it will be a very challenging build. Uh, so they want to build the house at 11, 12 Ruby and then use the other parcels as a garden and a homestead. They do have a very future plan of building a home at 1104 for their uh, parents to live right, right alongside them. But uh, that plan was a little too far out there to include that in this, but uh, let me see, check my notes here. The Land Bank Advisory Board had a comment uh, was, they're requesting a hold on this application until the garden policy can be finalized through the land bank uh, po policy review. Uh, we also got one survey in support of this project to give three parcels to this applicant. Um, and that was that was about it. Okay, so yes. Mr. Knapp has presented A1 through A10 for our consideration. And now I will go back and ask if any members of the commission have any comments or questions about any of these items. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do have questions on a couple of them. The first one, uh, Mr. Knapp, uh, dealt with the address uh, of 3306 North 33rd. Uh, is this near the Quindera ruins, you said? Yes, it is near, but it's like 700 and something feet away. 733 feet away from the environs of the Quindero ruins. So the environs are 200 feet. So ha, um, it's pretty far away. And we've approved this lot before to have a single family home built on. It, okay, so we approved this lot before, and what happened that the lot the applicant didn't, yeah, build didn't materialize. So that was over a year ago, then. That 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 is okay. correct. Okay, yeah, because my ears perked up when I heard the historical environs area. Okay, and answer that question. Um, the address of eleven sixteen Washington Boulevard. What again was the notice issue here? 
the land bank advisory board had a comment that said, uh, can we hold this property until I give notice to, to the neighbors? And it's not what I currently do, but I currently give notice to the neighborhood group and the uh, and Groundworks, the MBR. So I do give notice to those two, but just not the neighbors. Okay. Um, is there a neighborhood group operating in that area? Yes, Strugglers Hill. And I did get a confirmation email back from the president that they did receive it. He didn't give me any comments. He just said receive. Mm -hmm. And as I understand, that that is the job of the uh, neighborhood groups and the MBRs to give that. But, uh, that when, when I came into this role, that's what I was told who I give notice to and why was so they could reach out to, to the neighbors. So the neighborhood group did get it. Yes. Okay. Um, with the three lots on Ruby, the first one, 11, 12 is going to be the site of the home and the other two are going to be used. How they're just going to be used immediately. The immediate request is for them to be used as what? They want to put a garden on it. So they kind of want to do like, um, I think homesteading would be a little overstated, but they just they they just kind of want to grow grow their own food on on their property and have like a farm. Okay, I have a question here. I'm trying to formulate. I guess my concern is, uh, even though this is, I guess these would be adjacent properties. Are we really? What has been our uh, procedure or position with that kind of use. I know we did away with the um, garages for right now, but um, okay. that would be the question I would have. Commissioner, we haven't really, you know, if this was a normal lot, mm -hmm. that was a easy build, it would be like one lot for a house. <laughs> If it was a 25 foot lot and there's a 25 foot next to it, we've joined two together to make a 50 foot lot to make it easier to build. Mm -hmm. But because these lots are on such a slope and such a hill, <laughs> mm -hmm. that it's kind of these these lots are almost unbuilt. Okay, and it's because of that. Okay, I lumped all three together. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Mr. Stites, no. I will. I will say, I'm. Uh, I'm just going to say before we get to that, I do want to note that Mr. Bean is online with us, and I thank you for your persistence in submitting another application for that lot on South Mill Street. I am very familiar with that lot, and I'm going to be happy to see it improved. And I also want to say hello and thank you to Callie McLaughlin, who's joined us, and I assume she's our planning representative this evening. Yes, Commissioner. All right. Thank you, Callie, for being with us. Um, what I'll do before I ask for a motion is ask if we got any correspondence related to, and again, we're considering items A1 through A10, correct, Mr. Knapp? Yes, Commissioner. So I'll ask the clerk if we received any correspondence regarding any of the items A1 through A10. No comments received. I'll ask if anyone who is joining us on Zoom would like to make a comment on any of the items A1 through A10. If you'd like to, you can go ahead and raise your hand. I will recognize Ms. Elnora Jefferson, who's raised her hand. We'll go ahead and promote her so that she can speak. She can. Ms. Jefferson, if you would, just for the record, give us your name and city of residence for the record, and then we look forward to your comment. And we're still muted. I don't know whose end that is on. Uh, looks like we lost, unless she came over to the panelist side. It appears that we lost Ms. Jefferson. So we will wait for her to reconnect. Um, in the meantime, I see a William Dubois who is online. I hope I pronounced that last name correctly. If you would, please give us your name and city of residence for the record, and then you'll have up to three minutes to make your comments. Sure. Uh, yes, William Dubois, and I'm in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm actually here on behalf of my sister, who's the applicant for the Ruby uh, Avenue address. Um, she is traveling, and so unfortunate schedule uh, on a pre-planned trip was not able to be here, 
but I have some general uh, understanding and knowledge of the site and the application. And if there were any questions, I would be happy to at least attempt to answer those. So for the committee, are there any questions that Mr. Dubois could answer? We thank you for joining us here tonight. I don't see anyone indicating that they have questions or need further clarification. So thank you very much for being with us. Of course. Commissioner Burroughs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judd, did you state that on number 10 that the two lots behind them, they've asked for a hold for the additional two lots because of the garden? No, uh, so the applicant requested three lots to build one home on. Right. The hold came from the uh, the land bank advisory board comment that we should hold we should we should hold this request until the land bank like policy review committee comes back with their garden recommendations. Okay, and do we have any idea when that may come forward uh, to reschedule if we? or take it off hold. I mean, Mr. Chairman, I'm just, if the committee has asked us to put a hold on it till we get a review, I don't want to uh, create something going forward that we're not ready to deal with as we move forward. I'm, okay. This is when agreeing with legal. I don't believe it was the land bank um, policy committee that asked for the hold. It was the land bank advisory board that asked for the hold. And if I remember correctly, I think they also wanted that third lot because in the future, they intend to construct another house on that property for family members, but it's a little ways down the road. So they're not including that second house in the proposal as of right now, but they do intend eventually to put another house on those three lots. But um, the advisory board, I believe Judd uh, stated that he provides notices to the neighborhood groups. Oh no, that was a different issue. But the garden policy, if we give them this lot, the garden policy doesn't really affect doesn't really affect this particular issue. Um, we, I believe, hopefully, we'll have we'll be ready by this fall to provide. I mean, it, the, actually, probably even earlier than that to provide you all with a draft for consideration. So, but I don't think that the garden policy has much of an effect on this particular application. Well, great, thank you. And I guess the question is, do we? It's not necessary that we approve all three lots, or it is necessary that we approve all three lots, knowing that the garden issue is an issue. I think that question would be up to the applicant if they're willing to just take one lot or if it's a deal breaker if they don't get all three. Great, thank you. Excuse me, and then Judd, keep me up to date. Are those the three that Mr. Dubois is here to speak on? Yes. So in that case, uh, Mr. Dubois, we do have you still uh, talking is permitted. If you could unmute, and if you have any comments related to the, the question that Commissioner Burroughs raised regarding the three lots, basically now and or later. Sure, yes. Um, well, also not being my sister, I don't want to state anything definitively one way or the other. I know that she's very determined um, and she really likes the property from the standpoint of, you know, she, I've actually been out there as well. So the neighborhood um, kind of views out and um, also acknowledging the, the, uh, the great difficulty um, there. Uh, she's determined to kind of build one house first um, and, you know, learn, well, not, Hopefully there's not much learned there, but take those experiences and use that on that future house. But um, with the challenges, not build everything at once and bite off more than is realistic at, at the, the first time. But that being said, these three parcels are obviously, you know, kind of linked together and contiguous and would be great for building, you know, multiple houses on. And so that's how I should use it. And you know, I, I know that there's challenges with the grade, but actually, if you go back, there were previous um, domiciles on the properties. Um, it looks like at least one burned, though, and was demolished probably as a safety hazard. So um, they are buildable, and there were multiple houses there. Um, but as far as it being a deal breaker, I, I know that there's a lot of hope that all three will be granted with the idea that there will be multiple houses in the future, but only one now. So all that is a lot to say that when it comes down to it, I, I think a continuance would be preferred rather than 
than um, granting just one parcel. Thank you very much. Commissioner Bros, do you have any follow up with that? No, Mr. Chairman, I'm good. Thank you very much. I do also have two other hands raised. Um, Mr. Bean has raised his hand. And so if we could promote him, permit talking, and if you would give us your name and city of residence for the record, you'll have up to three minutes to make your comment. David Bean, Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, I just wanted to quickly thank Mr. Knapp for helping me sort out the details and the commission for viewing my proposal a second time. Uh, Mr. Knapp helped me figure out what I needed to put in there and, and corrected some of the things so I could do it better. Also, livable neighborhoods helped out a ton since the last meeting. Uh, they got like six different groups within KCK to come together and sorted out that lot of land next to me. If anybody lives or works near downtown Kansas City, Kansas, you should drive by if you've seen it before. It is a world difference. So thank you, Amina at Livable Neighborhoods and thank you, Commissioner, for seeing this again. Thank you, Mr. Knapp. That's it. And we'll just finish up the thank yous by thanking you again for taking proactive action to help the neighborhood there. We do appreciate that. And now we have Callie McLaughlin. Good evening, Callie McLaughlin, Planning and Urban Design. I just um, had a couple of comments here. Um, one goes back to eight and nine since this neighborhood is kind of, um, it's not necessarily a narrow lot design guide neighborhood, but I think it would behoove the applicant to speak with me um, about a narrow lot design for this property, especially with that rear garage entranceway. There are some benefits to doing that that I, I think um, that he would be interested in. And I um, I, I just wish that if, if he's interested to um, know that he can reach out to me and speak with us after the meeting, if so approved. Um, but mostly I wanted to make comment on A10 about 112 Ruby Avenue. Um, back to the three lots here. So I have worked with this applicant probably, I would say, about 30 hours of time on this project with her. Um, so I, again, not to speak totally on her, you know, the way her brother said, it, it's not, since she's not here, I don't want to speak totally on her behalf, but she is planning on doing um, a little bit more than just herself. She does want to live here long-term with her family. Um, right now, she's planning on building the house to live with her family and move them into the property. And then um, as she kind of recuperates from that financial part, build the second house, as she indicated, but with their um, family dynamic, she wants to be very close to them. So that's part of the reason she's wanting to do one house in 1104, one house in 1112. Um, I would say that it is pretty key that she wants to be able to do gardening and landscaping and some degree of homesteading on here. We have sent soil samples off to the conservation district. We've reviewed pages and pages of urban farming laws. She does have another property that she would wanted to use as a backup. However, it'd be the same situation where she's asking for multiple properties or multiple parcels to do the same purpose. Uh, she just preferred the neighborhood of this one. She liked the hillside view. She liked the location. She has met with neighbors. So I, you know, just take that for what you will. But I will say that she has spent significant effort with uh, myself and in building inspection and um, just reviewing all of her options. And she's put quite a bit of effort into this. So um you know whether that goes into the the whole everything or not is, is if we hold it over but i would say it it would probably affect her decision if she wanted to build maybe in the county or not if she knew that she was going to run into the into the um into not getting more than one parcel to be able to do this activity thank you very much Ms. mclaughlin i appreciate that mr bean i think uh, she has identified herself as a potential additional resource for you uh, on your lot. And so if you wish, you can follow up with her. And then Commissioner Bynum. Thank you, Chair. On A10, 11, 12 Ruby with the three parcels, I appreciate the work of our Land Bank Advisory Board. But in this case, I see the three parcels as different from what the Land Bank Policy Review Committee is considering with regard to um, gardens. And I would be certainly supportive of the three parcels for the applicant. And if they want to grow some food, then go for it. I'm growing food at my house right now. Well, I'm not, but someone else who lives there is. I mean, I'm, in, you know, I'm into it. So um, 
I don't. So you see are the this. happy recipient of food grown on your property. That's absolutely correct, and I don't. I just think this is different from what we are contemplating as part of our policy. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What I'd like to do is start with item A10 and make a motion based on a lot of things we've heard. The one thing that has been repeatedly stated, we can't speak for the applicant. There's nobody on board who can right now. And it may be, you know, germane to whether we do all three lots or just the 1112 Ruby. So based on that, I, I would like to move just to hold this item over to the next meeting of this committee. And hopefully the applicant will be in attendance and she can answer those questions. There's been a motion to hold A10 over until the next meeting. Is there a second? That motion does not move forward. There is no second. I do notice that uh, Ms. Elnora Jefferson is back on as an attendee, although I don't see her hand up. Ms. Jefferson, if you still would like to offer some comment, I'll offer you that opportunity now. Looks like we've got you promoted. Beautiful, you're unmuted. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this is Elnora Jefferson of Kansas City, Kansas. And the comment that I have is on A5. I've spoken with the Neighborhood Association of Girding Gardens a couple of times uh, since the Land Bank Advisory Board has met. And unfortunately, she was unaware of this application. And I know that Mr. Knapp does a phenomenal job of, um, of uh, involving neighborhoods and letting us all know, but for some reason, this one is missed. So in saying that, he's asked that that be held over um, and that connection be made between the applicant and, and the president of Girding Gardens. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jefferson. The committee can consider your request. I don't see any other hands raised. Mr. Bean, your hand is up again. As an applicant, I will give you another opportunity to speak, although ordinarily we don't. Sorry, I just missed the name of the woman who said she could help me. I'm definitely open for help. Ah, that's Callie, K-A-L-L-I-E. Ooh, I'm broadcasting this to every, everybody, Callie. And she is McLaughlin, M-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. I believe she is in planning and urban development. And, and there's Callie with her hand up. Callie, if you want to go ahead and clarify anything. Sure. Um, I'll give you my office number. I don't care. Everybody can have it. Everybody can reach me. 573-5762. Um, <laughs> uh, and I can give you the details on, on that kind of program for you. 573-5762. Correct. We'll get you two connected, and this will be a beautiful thing on South Mill Street. Okay. Commissioner Stites. Stites, District 7. Judd, would you give us the details again on A5? Is that is, is just give me the details again. Sure, this uh, applicant wants to build a home that they can live in. They want to live in. Um, That's what I want to know. Okay. It's it's the only application they're requesting, so they're just building this one. And that's it. And that's what we're. I mean, that's what we're targeting is for people to build homes, and uh, and it's encouraging that uh, most of these, if not all, are east of six thirty five, where we've identified that uh, housing is is needed, um, and they but they are wanting to uh, live, not rent, uh, to occupy the home. With that being said, I make a motion to approve. Uh, all applications A1 through A10. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you. I'm hoping that uh, my fellow commissioner would be amenable to um, amending his motion. Um, I think there was one uh, A5. The request, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad and want to see building uh, there too. But I think that's the one that 
that uh, Ms. Jefferson had indicated the uh, neighborhood group had not gotten notice of. Is that correct? That's that's what Ms. Jefferson said, yes. But uh, it is in the neighborhood group, and they did get an email. Which group is that? Uh, gardens? Thank you. Okay. Do we have evidence that an email was sent out or something to the neighborhood group? I could get it on my other computer. I beg your pardon? I can get it on my other computer, but I can't get it right now. But, I mean, you do have something that shows something was, was sent out. Yes, Commissioner. Okay. All right. Thank you. I would draw that. Thank you. So we have a motion to approve A1 through A10 as submitted. Is there a second? There is no second. That motion does not move forward. Is there another motion to take action on these properties as submitted to us? Yes, sir. Commissioner Townsend. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would make a motion to accept uh, the applications for A1 through A9, and then a separate vote could be had on 10. So my motion is to approve a one through a nine. So there is a motion to approve a one through a nine as submitted. Is there a second? A second. There is a motion and a second for a one through a nine. Roll call, please. Roll call, Bynum. Aye. Sites. Absolutely. Clarifying question. What does that do for a ten? Uh, that will be the subject of a motion to be delivered okay. in just a moment. No. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Is there a motion for A10? Find a move approval for A10. State second. There is a motion and a second to approve A10 as submitted. Roll call, please. Roll call, Bynum. Aye. Stites? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? No. Burroughs? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. That takes us, so if anyone online or anyone with us today has an agenda, and if you are considering or uh, if you are associated with applications A1 through A10, action has been taken on all of those. You can follow up with Mr. Knapp at a later date. For the next step in the process, Mr. Knapp, A11, please. Thank you, Commissioner. A A11 uh, used to be in this little section, but uh, the issues with it has been taken away because the lot is 50 feet and it's out of the narrow lot review, so that garage can't go on the front of the house. So uh, the uh, neighborhood group, uh, this is an investor that wants to build these to rent them. Um, the neighborhood group is Prescott, I believe. Um, and they said that they, uh, they appreciate more infill housing. So they are in favor of this application. Um, are you suggesting that we consider it by itself because there are some other issues you wish to discuss with the coming applications? I can go with a, I can, I can go a 12 too. So I can move to the next one. You could vote okay. on a 11 and a 12 at the same time. Um, this is at 28 North Tremont street. Uh, this is for a smaller house. You know what, Mr. Knapp, now that I see this one on the board, let's consider A11 first, please. There was a house on this lot at 23 South 18th as recently as about six years ago. Um, we did acquire it. I, we did tear it down. We want, I agree with the Prescott neighborhood. It'd be wonderful to see a house back on this lot. Mr. Burroughs. Good for approval. Townsend second. There's a motion and a second to approve A11 as submitted. Before I call the roll, I'll ask if there is, if we received any correspondence related to application A11. No comments received. Is there anyone joining us online who would like to make a comment on A11, 23 South 18th? Seeing no hands, is there anyone who's joined us here in the room who would like to make a comment on 
A11, if you would please uh, raise your hand, come to the lectern here in the center of the room. That little ring at the bottom of the microphone should be green. If it is, then we'll be able to hear you. If you would give us your name and your city of residence for the record, and then you'll have up to three minutes to make your comment. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Joseph Sorto. I'm the applicant for that property. And um, based on what I heard, um, I wanna, my vision is my goal is to invest on building uh, houses for the community because I know that will make a lot of those vacant lots, make it look nicer, you know, and helpful for the community. And for this specific property, it's like the first one that I'm gonna be working on in order to move with that vision, with uh, to grow up, you know, and um, get more lots going on. So it's gonna be the first one, the first one I'm gonna be working on with. And uh, if there's any changes that needs to be uh, made for the building process, I'm happy to make it to make it work with, because the the goal with it is gonna be for renting. So. That's the only thing I wanted to communicate. And thank you everyone for considering on the- on Thank the you so much. And that is the beauty of our option process is that you now control the property for the purpose of making the decisions that you still need to make in order to get that done. And I appreciate the garage on this because um, there is no street parking on 18th street at this point. So that garage will be a very necessary part of the construction. Thank you in advance for your work. Appreciate thank you, appreciate it, it everybody. <laughs> Is there anyone with us who would like to make comment on A11? Seeing no one, I believe we have a motion and a second to approve as submitted. Roll call, please. Roll call, Bynum? Aye. Stites? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you so much. That takes us to A12. Mr. Knapp? A12 is at 28th North Tremont Street. It's for a tiny home, 600 square feet. Um, with this zoning of R1B, the minimum is 750 square feet. So that means that they would have to get a variance from planning and that would require another public meeting. And they, they want to live in it, so. I thank you, Mr. Knapp. I appreciate that. I appreciate the application. One of the things I mentioned in agenda review is I wanna make sure that this applicant is fully aware that to the best of my recollection, we vacated Calvin Street some three or four years ago when a property owner was contemplating some bigger development on that parcel. And I believe that said property owner who vacated Calvin because he owns property on either side of it. I don't know what's listed there as 26 or 30 North, uh, who owns, those are private owners. Fascinating. I mistakenly thought the developer had acquired all of those properties. Uh, I am mistaken. I think as long as we would just inform this applicant of what has happened with Calvin Street in the past, then forewarned is forearmed in this case, as long as you know everything going in up front, then this applicant could continue with the public process. Any comments or questions from the commission? Commissioner Bynum. Well, Commissioner, I'm having that recall as well. So I wonder if that's a, a check-in with even our um, minutes to confirm, but nonetheless, uh, I if, would- if, if Mr. Knapp will, can you just click right there where your cursor is, Mr. Knapp? Yeah, and that's, and that is the developer that owns both sides of Calvin Street. And I am, I'm 99% sure we vacated it, even though it still exists, because when we reconstructed 7th Street, I'm pretty sure we put a curb to block access to Calvin Street. So my question originally was that it's actually for Ms. McLaughlin that tiny homes don't are not allowed by code, but with a variance, apparently it could happen is what I think I'm understanding about this. Commissioner Bynum, you are so in luck because 
Callie has her hand raised to answer your question. Hello, this is Callie Cleaning and Urban Design um, to talk a little bit about that South Parcel development there on Calvin Street. Um, when you kind of look at the larger picture, it does appear that we have combined that into one parcel. But when you look at the actual zoning of that parcel, it's still several different mixed zones. So um, it appears that that development is either incomplete or the shot clock has kind of run down on that to, to complete. Uh, depending on how you want to look at it, they most likely need to come up with a final development plan and come back for that to remedy some issues and refine their their project. So I'm not sure if we could really look at that as a deterring factor from this particular parcel, uh, just because it would still probably need to go through a larger plan development process. Um, as far as lot 28 goes, um, when we get down to the narrow lot design guidelines, we did have a similar situation on the other property that I'm currently working on where um, the really only way to give a variance on house size that we have right now is to um, show an extenuated circumstance where you would not be able to create a house with sufficient um, th there's some underlying factor, like a significantly small, almost unbuildable parcel at this time. So there would have to be an, an underlying circumstance that would mitigate that size on that. Um, we are looking for a, a tiny house kind of code, but that doesn't seem like it's going to be happening within the next year or so. Uh, we're not quite there yet. We have other things on the planning plate, such as, you know, short-term rental ordinances and so on. So um, unfortunately, she would have to meet the um, the square footage requirement of that district. However, there is a caveat with being part of the narrow lot design guidelines, which does allow for that ADU in the rear of the property. Um, the narrow lot design guidelines allows for the detached rear garage with a uh, accessory dwelling unit above it or studio apartment, which that goes back to um, kind of see me about, you know, giving you the plans and the design guidelines for that individually offline. Um, but it is possible to integrate off street parking and such um, when we do just integrate a little bit better architecture and some creativity into these lots. So um, unfortunately, square footage has to be there for right now, unless they can prove through variance that they have an underlying circumstance that would prohibit them from doing so some other way. Fantastic, thank you. You mentioned a final design review. I don't think that there was ever a preliminary design review on anything related to that bigger parcel. So it yeah. is speculative at best. It might have been done as a preliminary plat, um, preliminary change of zone or, um, you know, with a vacation, with the intent to come back I, with some refining. But at this time, yeah, it I doesn't look like of, it. I've been part of more than one meeting regarding that parcel. And so far, nothing has panned out. Yeah. So. Um, I appreciate that. Do any other members of the committee have any comments or questions regarding this particular parcel? Davis moved to approve. We've got a motion and a second to approve as submitted. Before we take that vote, we'll just double check to see if anyone submitted written correspondence regarding A1228 North Tremont. No comments were received. Thank you. Is there anyone joining us online who would like to comment on A1228 North Tremont Street? And then finally, is there anyone joining us here who would like to comment on A1228 North Tremont? Seeing no one coming forward, roll call, please. Roll call, Bynum. Aye. Stites. Aye. Davis. Aye. Townsend. Aye. Burroughs. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Knapp, A13 and or 14. I was going to do A13 by itself. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Do them all at once. No. But, uh, it's all good. A, A13 is at 2515 North 63rd Street. Uh, this is uh, the one to build a single family home on this parcel. This parcel is 2.87 acres. And during our staff review, uh, it came out that uh, this parcel is actually split up into 14 different parcels on, on its plat. Uh, I was told that uh, our uh, GSS can split those parcels out to today and map them out to make 14 different parcels. Uh, I know in the land bank, I get several requests for, do you have whole subdivisions? And this would be a whole subdivision. Um, so staff uh, is not recommending approval for one home on this big lot. Um, they would rather cut it up and have 14 homes. 
Thank you, Mr. Knapp. Comments or questions? Commissioner Stites. Stites, District 7. So when you say that you've had time to time have had uh, developers come in and asking for whole subdivisions, have they been steered towards this location? I did not know about it until I met with staff. Because so hopefully you've kept good notes and now you can, well, of course I can't potentially good. could reach back out to them and let them know if this does the outcome of this would uh, that there may be a location. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions from committee? Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and to uh, Mr. Bell Ortiz is the name of the applicant, I uh, would invite them to come back and apply for one of the 14 parcels um, if this uh, location is um, of their desire or many of the other parcels that we have in Land Bank. Uh, but with that, I will move to deny this application. There's a motion and a second to deny this application as submitted. Before we take the vote, I'll just ask if we received any written correspondence regarding North 63rd Street, A13. No comments were received. Did not. I'll ask if there's anyone joining us online who'd like to comment on A13, North 63rd Street. I see no hands being raised. I'll ask if there's anyone who's joined us here, if they'd like to comment on North 63rd Street. I see no one coming to the lectern. Roll call, please. Roll call, Bynum. Aye. Stites. Aye. Davis. Aye. Townsend. Aye. Burroughs. McKiernan. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Knapp. All right, A14 and A15 are on the same lot. So two people want the same lot. So. A14 uh, got their application in first, um, but there is theirs is for a, man, a manufactured home. Um, and then A15 got theirs in like 15 days after that other one. Um, but uh, RA Engineering has rehabbed several houses. Um, they're a proven land bank builder and um, So kind of sums up. <laughs> yes. Comments or questions from the committee on these two applications for the same parcel? Commissioner Davis. I see identical names, but Judd, can you confirm that for one of, for A14, it's the same applicant as A13? Yes, Commissioner, that, that is correct. Uh, he's looking to build, he's looking to start his business of building these homes. So the newly to be replatted on North 63rd Street would be a perfect place to start building homes. Yes. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Commissioner Townsend. I just want to follow up that to make sure I understand what uh, Commissioner Davis just brought to our attention. So 14 and 15 are applicants buying for the same piece of property. Uh, 14 is also the same individual who we just denied the application because he wanted to build one home on 14 plats, correct? Okay. Uh, and Mr. Knapp, uh, between 14 and 15 applicants for the same property, who came first, did you say? A14. A14. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Mr. Bynum. Does our building code or zoning dictate where a manufactured home can go? Why, Callie was as quick as you could be on her hand and she will answer your question right now. Good evening, Ms. Callie, Planning and Zoning. Um, as far as manufactured home, no. 
uh, not necessarily by zoning code. However, there are some design guidelines in different areas of the city, like the Prairie Doyle Piper plan. There are some things going on in Rosedale that do dictate that, but in this particular area, there is not. However, if you do look at the pictures that the applicant is supplying, I just wanna be very clear that it is a manufactured home and not a mobile home. Um, which are two different things. So that does appear to be a manufactured home, but when you scroll through the rest of the photos, it it looks like it might be a mobile home, the way the skirting was done, I'm not entirely sure. Um, as long as it is not a mobile home, a manufactured, that, that looks pretty mobile home to me in that photo. Um, there are some specific standards and how mobile homes are placed on a parcel. And as long as they could prove that they can meet those standards, then they would still they would still be able to do so. And that's that's found in the um, RM section of our zoning code. So um, if it's a mobile home, yes. If it is a manufactured home, no. And there's no other underlying design guidelines for the, other than that that I'm aware of. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Commissioner Townsend. Did I hear that correctly? Did, did uh, Ms. McCauley say that mobile homes, yes, and manufactured homes, no? That is correct. Mobile homes have a particular way that they have to be placed on a parcel if they are going to be put in a district that is not an RM mobile home manufactured home district, uh, which is a manufactured home has to deal with the way it's constructed off site and then put together on site, whether um, a mobile home is usually on a movable chassis. So it's a different type of construction, even though they look similar. So we just need that clarification that um, if they decide to go with a mobile home, that they will follow the um, the building inspection code for that as far as mounting it on a permanent foundation and so on, um, and that they also orient it the way that's prescribed in the RM zoning district. But, okay, but there'd be requirements for the placement of a manufactured home, wouldn't there be also? Uh, not quite in the same way. Um, a okay. manufactured, a manufactured home um, isn't considered a mobile. It's it doesn't come on a mm -hmm. chassis. It's built on site, um, and by default comes with the ability to put it on a foundation. Whereas a mobile home, you have to specify to them that they need to be anchored permanently, affixed to a foundation, that they have to be oriented with the front door facing the property line. Whereas mobile homes, usually their door faces sideways towards their adjacent neighbor. Um, so there, there's some extra specifications like that that don't necessarily apply to a manufactured home. Okay, I guess what I'm trying to get to is for either iteration of home, there would be um, certain things that would have to be followed, right? There would be. It's just a little okay. bit more challenging for a mobile home. Okay, but it's not that either one could not be placed there. Correct. Based on our, okay. Uh, and Mr. Knapp, the applicant at number 15 who wants the same property, can you show me again what his depiction of what he wanted to put there look like? Ooh, can barely see, but a more traditional looking home. Yes, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. Other comments or questions? Commissioner Bynum. I just wonder if I hate to say it, but perhaps we could speak with the applicants because the gentleman in A14, in his applicant information, says, I have spent 10 years in, as an architectural drafter designing houses and layouts for homeowners and contractors. My father-in-law is a 30-year general contractor, which would lead me to believe that he wants to design and build a home, but that's not the picture we've been given. So it confuses me. And for whatever it's worth, you know, applicant two is suggesting a more traditional looking home that certainly fits in with the character of the neighborhood much more than a mobile home or a manufactured home. Commissioner Bynum, you probably haven't been in a meeting where I've opined that a lot of the pictures that are included with these applications are just uh, chosen with a dart because there is actually a picture in one of the applications for tonight that is an existing home on North 10th Street. I know exactly where it is. 
And I suppose it's just a reasonable facsimile of what will be constructed there. But um, so are you making a motion that we hold these two over for the purpose of speaking with both applicants? I am. I will so move that we hold A14 and 15 for the purpose of speaking with the applicants. Townsend second. There's a motion and a second, Commissioner Stites. What would I do without you? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so tell me if I'm right. A15 was the applicant for A13? No, no. no, backwards. So A14 now, maybe, that they may be interested in looking at a single location of the um, of A13, right? So maybe we can help them both. And not to muddy the waters, Commissioner Stites, but let me do it. Thank you. If you look down under application B2, you'll find the same applicant as your lower A15. Okay. So each of the two applicants for that property on North 86th Street have other applications for other locations. But uh, the, we're going to hold these over for the period of one month with instructions for Mr. Knapp to contact them both and clarify what? What exactly it is they would hope to build. Okay, so to, just to clarify what they're going to build mm -hmm. on those properties. Mm -hmm. There's been a motion and a second. I'll just, for the sake of thoroughness, ask if we received any correspondence regarding A14 or 15. No comments received. I'll ask if anyone online would like to comment on A14 or 15 North 86th Street. I see no hands being raised. I'll ask if anyone who's joined us here would like to comment on 14 or 15 North 86th. I see no hands. Roll call, please. Roll call. Bynum? Aye. Stites? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Knapp? Letter B, Section B. Right. I believe Section B, I could go through all three of them, but if you don't think so, just stop me. Okay, uh, B1 is at 1837 North South 35th Street. Um, this one, the applicant wants to build three units. The zoning is currently for two units, uh, and this would require a zoning change to R3, so this would require another public meeting. Uh, RP5 is in the area, so staff doesn't see an issue with changing it to R3. All right, B2 is with RA Engineering, the same applicant as A15 that we just talked about. Uh, they want to build a 10 unit uh, multifamily apartment. Um, that's what they plan it to look like. Um, it is zoned correctly for, for this, so there wouldn't necessarily be another public meeting, but because of that RP5, the P in there, there would be a plan review from planning where they look at it. And I do have to say that uh, since this is a multifamily, it will go through the DRC process and they'll have a bunch of staff in. Yeah, could you just zoom out on that um, just so that the rest of the committee can appreciate that this is in a multifamily district. Zoom in just a little bit more so we see the, the aerial. There we go. Thank you. All right. E3. So that takes us to B3, that's at 5666 Yecker Avenue. Uh, this applicant is kind of torn on if they want to do a duplex or a single family home. Um, it is currently zoned R1 for single family, but there is duplexes in this neighborhood. So it would, it would match the character of the neighborhood if there was a zoning change for a duplex and the zoning change would require another public meeting. So, Commissioner, that concludes items in the B section. Thank you. Comments or questions from the committee? Davis moves to approve. Right, second. It's a motion and a second to approve all three of the B items as submitted. That's B1, B2, and B3. I'll just ask if you received any correspondence regarding any of these items. No comments were received. I'll ask if anyone who's joined us online would like to comment on any of these three multifamily applications. I don't see any hands being raised. 
I'll ask if anyone who's here in the room with us would like to comment on any of these three multifamily applications. I do not see any, anyone coming forward. Roll call, please. Roll call, Bynum. Aye. Stites. Aye. Davis. Aye. Townsend. Aye. Burroughs. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Knapp. So that takes us into our commercial item. C1 is at 961 Pacific Avenue. Um, this parcel, they want, they currently own, they rent a insurance agency at 10th and Kansas Avenue. The rent's increasing and they want to build their own building. So they're looking for a place to do that. But unfortunately, this location is zoned R1. So that's for single family home. Uh, and during my staff reviews, they're like, there needs to be a little bit of transition between residential and commercial. There needs, so they thought that maybe it could be like a, uh, a mixed use building with residential up top. Um, but looking at each corner is commercial all already at 10th and Pacific. Um, so basically they'll need a change of zone to commercial to build their building here. My observation was the same as yours, Mr. Knapp, that there are commercial on the other three corners of that intersection. Any comments or questions from the committee? Davis moves to approve. Townsend second. There's been a motion and a second to approve as submitted. Just to be thorough, did we receive any correspondence regarding this application? No comments were received. I'd ask if there's anyone online who would like to comment on this application, which would be C1, 10th and, Kansas, or 10th and Pacific Avenue, rather. I see no hands being raised. I'll ask if there's anyone here in the room who would like to comment on this application. Seeing no one coming forward, roll call, please. Roll call, Bynum. Aye. Stites. Davis. Aye. Townsend. Aye. Burroughs. McKiernan. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Knapp, C2. C2 is at 1301 North 2nd Street. The plan is to get, it's for U.S. trailer. They run a trailer rental business where companies can come rent trailers, uh, come pick them up from this location and uh, take them wherever they need to go. The only problem with this one is we have some silos on this lot that are standing here. Um, the uh, When I first got here, we got a demo estimate. It'll cost us $500,000 to demo those uh, silos, and that's three years old. Um, so the, so what this application will do, they'll tear down the silos, they'll put a parking lot, they'll build a building, they'll have five employees on site, and they'll uh, rent trailers from it. Um, the staff comments on this one, uh, parking trailers requires a special use permit, and the Northeast uh, KCK Heritage Trail Plan has this as a possible stormwater asset in, in their plan. Uh, the Land Bank Advisory Board Groundwork opposes this uh, application. They see this property could be used for bigger things since we have the uh, since we have the Rock Island Bridge and just tapping into that closeness to to the river. There could be some economic benefit by keeping this. Um, and then the Fairfax Industrial Association, uh, they had no objections with this project. Thank you, Mr. Knapp. Comments or questions from the committee? Mr. Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would appreciate the opportunity to talk more about um, to the proposal, um, the person proposing this about what this is. Uh, I know that there has been some interest for development in that area, um, more in keeping with additional housing but I, I would ask for the opportunity to speak more directly with this uh, person proposing uh, and just move to hold this over to the next month. Davis second. I, I, I was going, going to say though, I know that I was reading within this profile, this is a potential business that would be coming over. And so if it's not this particular area, which I completely understand, I think it would behoove us and staff and whoever to really maybe find another location in which it would mm -hmm. be best fit, if not this one. I would just hate for us to lose on that economic opportunity. Yeah. But I do second that. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Stites. 
I got my microphone, Davis. Thank you. Um, well, I can only assume that that demo didn't go down from the $500,000. It probably went up. The zoning here is M3 heavy, right? Not residential. And I don't know, are those lots to the um, west? 1411, 12, oh, my eyes are going, 12, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, those are residents or what What are those to the, that side? If I remember right, they were kind of like just storage lots, right? From from the aerial views, it looks like there's trailers on 1201 currently. There's really, there's just two buildings on 1411. And trailers on 1,000. So it really fits the character of the neighborhood, heavy industrial type M3 zoning. And um, I, I, I would say, you know, somebody that's wanting to relocate and then put a, a business in our downtown area, which we think, I think we all want, and they're going to have, what'd you say, five jobs, right? Um, foot the bill for the demo and get it get it off of our land bank properties and start paying taxes, property taxes, I think is a good thing. I, I don't, I hope we don't drag our feet so long that they look to go elsewhere because I, as we all know with development and if they're looking for a, a, a location, time kills all deals. And I hate kicking things down the road and, and um, potentially seeing someone go elsewhere. I, I am, uh, I will be voting no because I am ready to uh, not kick this can down the road. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments or questions? Commissioner Townsend. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and I can appreciate Commissioner Stites' concern about losing opportunity that I think one month is not going to really kill the deal so that we give the people who live in that area and live near there and as we look at redoing that area uh, just some more time and as Commissioner Davis suggested, look somewhere else for this that might be more suitable. So I appreciate that. I, while I appreciate that, I, as I look at the aerial, I'm not sure how many people actually live within right. a block or two of that. There is some over at Third Street, it would appear that there is. But I mean, I certainly appreciate wanting to be more thoughtful and deliberate about this, but I personally think it would be a benefit for us if those elevators were to come down. So, so we've had a motion and a second to hold this for the period of one month for the purpose of talking with the applicant in greater detail about the plans for the area. I'll ask if there was any correspondence regarding this item, which is C2. No comments or received. I'll ask if anyone who's joining us online would like to make a comment on this application. C2, I do have Elnora Jefferson. Ms. Jefferson, we will enable you to speak. You are now. Go ahead and unmute. If you would just, for the record, name and city of residence, and then three minutes for your comments. Thank you, Commissioner McKinnon. This is Elnora Jefferson, Kansas City, Kansas. And the... Um, I want to say that I, in looking at this application, I perused the Northeast Kansas City, Kansas uh, Heritage Trail. And this particular location, if, from my understanding, has the potential to aid the unified government in meeting its qualifications or its commitment, excuse me, on the consent decree that it has with the EPA. This area also, as was said by staff, facilitates the stormwater overflow, facilitates the green infrastructure, and returns to the Northeast, something that is, is very much needed. It wasn't until I had an opportunity to meet a legacy uh, historian uh, that I really fully understood that this area to the East that we see, beyond the silos and so forth, is some of the original land where the Wyandotte um, Native Americans, as well as Lewis and Clark, the call and so forth, had their historical beginnings, which is all part of the heritage of Northeast KCK. 
with that and the ability to overlook and look at Kansas City, Missouri, and in some cities as well as to develop that riverfront, I would like to add that if this commission sees favor to approve the one month holdover, that it also consider a component of adding the expertise of uh, directors, uh, 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 Gunnar Hand, um, Jeff Fisher, and others who can really sit down and go over this amount of information that's in the plan and tell us what we would be doing were we to allow this particular application to go forward versus what it could be for the future. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jefferson. Appreciate the comment. I don't see any other hands raised online. I'll ask if there's anyone here joining us in the room who'd like to make a comment on this application. Seeing no one come forward, there has been a motion and a second to hold this over for the period of one month for the purpose of talking with the applicant. Roll call, please. Roll call. Bynum? Aye. Sites? Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Motion carries. C3, Mr. Knapp. All right, C3 is at 2280 Russell Avenue. This is um, the, the applicant wants to build a tractor storage lot for owner operators that are in the area uh, so they could park their trucks. Um, this is the picture they provided me. Uh, staff's comments on this would require a variance in the change of zone and both items would require another public meeting. Uh, the Land Bank Advisory Board is not recommending this project for approval. Commissioner Burroughs. Thank you. Move for denial. Davis second. There's a motion and a second to deny this application as submitted. I'll ask if we received any correspondence regarding this particular application. No comments were received. Thank you. I'll ask if there's anyone online who'd like to comment on C3 Russell Avenue. I see no hands raised online. I'll ask if there's anyone in the room with us who'd like to comment on C3 Russell Avenue. There's been a motion and a second to deny the application as submitted. Roll call, please. Roll call, Bynum. Aye. Sites. Aye. Davis. Aye. Townsend. Burroughs. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Knapp, C4. C4 is at 1902 North 7th Street. It's uh, multiple parcels on that block there. Uh, they want to build, um, th this was held over from last month's meeting and the applicants wants to build a mixed use building out of shipping containers, eight residential units and the commercial ground floor. Uh, the developer has met with Groundworks about this project before I brought it to you. Uh, and then the Land Bank Advisory Board uh, asked for a list of other projects that they have been working on or been involved with. I did get that, and actually the addresses are over here on the side. Um, the addresses are here of the other projects they're involved with. Um, they also, the Land Bank Advisory Board had a comment that the neighborhood neighbors were not notified um, because there is no neighborhood group in this area, but that's why I referred them to Groundworks. Um, and then the staff's comments on this project is a change of zone. Uh, and a master plan amendment. Both of those would require another public meeting. And this, that, uh, and the applicant also has a PowerPoint they would possibly like to share. Turn that on. I'd ask the committee uh, if you wish to view the PowerPoint that's been submitted. Mr. Knapp, if you could go ahead and bring that up, please. I don't know if they're online. I don't you know see, what it I, is. I only have two people who are online right now, and I have a Nancy Hernandez, and then I have a Samsung. I take it that that is a mobile phone ID number that I'm looking at online. If either of the people who are online are connected with this application. I'd ask you to raise your hand so that you can help inform the committee about this application, which is C4 on North 7th Street, mixed use development. Neither of the 
people who are online are raising their hand right now. Do you have this PowerPoint loaded locally here or do they need to show it remotely? I have it. Can it I be present off of it? But can it be viewed on the screen? There's more. It's like 15 slides, but I, <laughs> that's why I can't present it. So we've got a PowerPoint on auto advance. No, I'm advancing it. Oh, you're advancing it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is there any architecture to it or, I mean, design or I make a motion we hold it over until next month till we get our, we they get their spell this at least once, I believe. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, at my request, this was held over to allow me time to meet with the developers and also the neighborhood group that is adjacent. What you're seeing is basically proposed at the corner of uh, 7th and Parallel traffic way that would be the northwest corner so it is a major thoroughfare point uh, not only for district one but throughout the city it's on a hot route let me also um, note that the applicant's uh, request would be right across the street to parcels that were part of the tree mount project that we heard uh, presented at last month's meeting. Uh, Ms. Elnora Jefferson and uh, Ms. Vanessa Gilliam, who's president of the Caring Neighbors Association, whose territory does involve this area now. It may not have a month ago, but they were right adjacent to it. Uh, we did meet with uh, the proposed um, developers and My concern with this is that it does not um, meet from a compatibility aspect with what has been proposed, a thoughtful proposal uh, for the tree mount development. Also on the same side of the street, but further north and a little bit west about a year ago, this committee approved an option agreement for more traditional looking uh, multi apartments and townhouses that I, I'm, I'm sure having talked to Council Kurt Peterson, uh, forgive me, I don't remember the names of the uh, actual developer, but that prompt that is moving forward. So this would be this would stick out and not, I believe, the most compatible way. Um, for these. I also, um, because I do want to encourage development in Wyandotte County and District 1, um, refer the developers to the three areas that the UG set out for requests for qualifications to build. One being the site near six in Minnesota. Uh, the other uh, near 18th and Quindaro is possible development. Uh, we did not talk about the Indian Springs. However, I believe if anything, these might work better somewhere else, but not on the proposed corner. So I would move to deny this application as presented. Thank you. I would, uh, personal observation, and Commissioner Stice will get to you in just a second. Personal observation would be because it's across the street from another proposed development should not automatically preclude any uh, application from coming forward and be fully considered. I think there are other considerations for this one that would cause me to support your motion, but just being geographically uh, adjacent, I do not believe is grounds uh, for denial. Commissioner Stites? I would agree. Um, and I 
in my little rant there, I made a motion. I will rescind that motion. Okay. And I will second Commissioner uh, Townsend's motion. We now have a motion and a second to deny the application as submitted. Commissioner Davis? Um, yeah, and I, I agree with that motion. And again, I, I it'll probably for the, there's a lot of things for landing policies we, we want to look at, but these shipping container designs are very popular because of the affordability of the building. And so um, there's a lot of discussion we can have at that level, but I would encourage all members of this particular committee to look at what is happening with these designs because they aren't going anywhere, especially given the cost of building new anything um, across this country. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Townsend. Thank you. Uh, and I agree uh, that the consideration of a thoughtful, um, pre-planned and worst development across the street should not be the only consideration. Were even not having that, I still believe that as presented, this is in the wrong location for the way that it looks. So I, I thank you for reminding me that was a point I wanted to make. And there may be some use for this, which is why during that conversation on about April 10th, following our last meeting, I encouraged them to look at other places and, and where the unified government is actively seeking uh, developers. But I, I believe, and Ms. Gilling was supposed to be on the night, that this is the wrong place at the wrong location, wrong design, wrong, wrong location. Thank you. Commissioner Bynum. Thank you. I just want to address a comment from our Land Bank Advisory uh, Board, and that is uh, the last statement, residents that live outside of an official neighborhood group are not getting notified of upcoming projects. Should they be treated equally? And I think that's a comment that could go to our um, policy review committee to have a conversation about how could we make that happen. Thanks. Thank you. Let's see, I don't think I've asked for correspondence on this one. Did we receive any correspondence related to C4? No comments were received. I'll ask if anyone who's joining us online would like to comment on C4 North 7th Street. I'll ask if anyone in the room would like to comment on C4 North 7th Street. Seeing no one coming forward, there was a motion and a second to deny the application as submitted. Roll call, please. Roll call, Bynum. Aye. Sites. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Burroughs? McKiernan? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Knapp. That takes us to item number two on our agenda. Yes, Commissioner. This is at 812 Lafayette Avenue. We've seen this one last month. This was a lot split between two neighbors. Last month we did 814, uh, uh, and they're going to split the lot like Two thirds, eight fourteen, and then a third to eight twelve. So eight, so eight ten gets their shared driveway that used to be there for the house, and then eight twelve can do some grading work. Um, so water doesn't flow in their basement. Mr. Burroughs, move for approval. Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve as submitted. Given the fact that this has been before us several times, I, I will ask if there's anyone who'd like to comment on this application. We have received numerous communications about this prior to tonight's meeting. I do believe everything has been communicated. I'll ask for a roll call, please. Roll call, Bynum? Aye. Sites? Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. That property transfer is approved as submitted. Mr. Knapp, that takes us to item number three, Land Bank Hold Area. Yes, Commissioner. So this is a hold area that was requested in the last standing committee when Mount Carmel came up with their Tremont project. Uh, this hold area is from on Parallel Avenue from 7th Street to 5th Street and then all the way to Quindaro Boulevard from 5th Street to 7th Street. Thank you. That That's it? Okay. I'm in, uh, I'm in uncharted waters here. Uh, Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is in connection. This was the next step to be taken pursuant to moving forward the tree mount project that this committee 
maybe plus one or two members here. It was heard in the economic development setting last month and uh, was enthusiastically uh, welcomed as development, long-term development in an area that everyone says has long been neglected, and that's true. Uh, the proponents from Mount Carmel are here. Um, Councillor Herb Hardwick and Executive Director of Mount Carmel, Ms. Pamela Smarter here. If uh, the group wants, you know, the committee wants to hear anything, but this was the announced next step. So um, I would move to approve. Davis submitted. Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve as submitted. I will offer either of you the opportunity, if you wish to take it, to address the committee regarding this application. Just make sure the little green light is on at the base of the microphone. We're good to go. If you give us your name and city of residence for the record. Absolutely. Uh, good evening. Uh, Herb Hardwick, Hardwick Law Firm, LLC, 2405 Grand Boulevard, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, good evening. Uh, on behalf of Mount Carmel, we are pleased to come forward with respect to the Tremont project. We believe that it is a transformational project. Uh, that will have a major impact on the community. Uh, we are very clear that in order to proceed uh, and to be successful, uh, we need the unified governor, government to be a partner of ours. And with this step, uh, we believe that this is a significant action to convey that to the marketplace so that we can initiate this uh, project uh, over the next few months and next few years. So thank you. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer. We thank you very much for your continued efforts in redeveloping this. Mr. Knapp, do we, is, or, or I guess Mr. Hardwick, I could ask you as well. Is there a time frame contemplated with this hold or is it time limited or open-ended or time limited? This is Wendy Green with Legal. The way the resolution is written, it's pretty much unlimited. There's no time frame within the resolution. So there was a resolution submitted with the item. So if that would, if the committee would like to modify that, it could be modified, but as of right now, there is no time frame. Mr. Townsend. Thank you for that question, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this harkens back to at least 2013 when I came on at that time, there was no limitation for commercial holds. Um, and I don't know that I'm necessarily advocating for one now, uh, this project is so new, I uh, don't want to unnecessarily burden them, but I think it would be appropriate to have maybe a check-in by this group at a certain period of time, the second year or whatever. We're not even doing that right now with the option agreements, although there is a time limitation. I know that there have been some that are over a year old just on those. So with a project undertaking of this magnitude, um, I think it would be reasonable initially not to put any time limit on it, but the, but the developers would have the expectation that as this committee would want for them to come in periodically for an update, progress update. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Oop, I'm sorry, I'll go to Wendy Green first. Thank you, Wendy Green with Legal. I was just going to make a suggestion that if you're worried about a time frame. Um, the land bank could always bring it back for another item for a rescission of the whole. If if it goes on for a number of years and nothing's being done. Which is effectively, if I recall, what we did with the Northeast hold area 10 years ago, maybe, mm -hmm. was that we actually took action to lift the hold on that area mm -hmm. at that time. So that would be an option for us moving forward. Yeah. As, uh, Commissioner Davis, did I recognize you? Um, just real quick, I am... I, I believe that we need to give um, these folks the time and the confidence that they, get they, that they can take to other developers. So I'm fine with not necessarily putting any particular time frame on this. However, in the land bank policy review discussions, we are discussing an option where um, for a situation like this, the committee would grant it for two years and then after that two years, staff would decide whether or not to grant another two years. And then if there were still more, more problems, then staff would come back. So it would be a total of four 
not advocating that that would be the particular situation here, um, but that is something that we are contemplating from a process standpoint. So just wanted to make that uh, clear and put that out there. Thank you, Chair. So although that would not, that would not, not necessarily, it would not apply to this application, it is something that the committee is considering for future development in policy. In the meantime, Ms. Green and Mr. Waters will undoubtedly be in contact with the group just to help take the next steps in the process. And so I feel comfortable we will have our fingers on the pulse of this project moving forward. Um, there has been a motion and a second to approve as submitted. I will just for completeness sake ask if we received any written communication regarding this application. No comments. Uh, I'm sorry, regarding this request for action. No comments. None. I'll ask if anyone online would like to comment on item number three, land bank hold area. Seeing no hands raised, we thank you both for attending tonight and for sticking with us until the very end. We appreciate your work both tonight and moving forward. Uh, there's been a motion and a second to approve as submitted. Roll call, please. Roll call. Bynum? Aye. Sykes? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you so much. We have one more item of business, and that is a motion to adjourn. Davis moved to adjourn. Townsend second. There's been a motion and a second to adjourn this meeting. Roll call, please. Roll call. Bynum? Aye. Sykes? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Motion carries. Committee, staff, participants, thank you all very much. We are adjourned.